Good morning and good evening, everyone. Greetings from Korea. My name is Hisan Kim, and I'm head of International Cooperation Division at KDI School of Public Policy and Management. Thank you for joining us today for this year's Korea-US Policy Dialogue Dr. online conference. The conference will take place over two days to discuss the theme of economic inequality and the future of the middle class. The program consists of three sessions in total, two of which will be conducted today, and the last one will be held tomorrow. A total of 10 experts from Korea and the United States are with us here, and I'd like to say once more that we really appreciate their time and efforts to bring out their research and share with us today. This event is being broadcast live on KDI School's YouTube channel with attendees from around the world. Thank you online viewers for your interest and participation. Now, let us begin the event with the opening remarks from Dean of KDI School. Please welcome Dean jong il Yu to the screen. Good morning and good evening, everyone. As the host of this year's Korea-US Policy Dialogue, Economic Inequality and the Future of the Middle Class, and on behalf of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, I'd like to extend my warmest welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be with you for this important meeting, and I'm grateful for your willingness to share your insights and contribute to understanding economic inequality and the future of middle class in Korea and the United States. Uh, KDI School has been hosting the US-Korea uh, Policy Dialogue since 2020, promote uh, scholarly exchanges and discussions on pressing issues that are of common interest to both countries. The first policy dialogue was held in Washington, DC. It was a face-to-face -face gathering right before the outbreak of the pandemic. And we discussed trade protectionism and changing global value chains. Last year, we had a virtual gathering uh, to discuss political polarization that have been afflicting both countries recently. The importance and timeliness of this year's topic, economic inequality and the future of middle class, couldn't be overemphasized. Uh, although the more immediate issues concerning the pandemic and the war are grabbing our attention lately, the inequality problem is equally, if not more, important and in some ways more fundamental. One could argue the rising income inequality and declining middle class are important causes of the weakening of democracy, the rise of populism, ethnocentrism, and authoritarianism in many parts of the world, which have hampered our responses to the pandemic and increased our proclivity towards conflict and confrontation rather than solidarity and cooperation. There's been a lot of talk about the inequality problem, at least ever since the global financial crisis. Uh, President Obama, for example, declared that it was the defining challenge of our time in a famous speech in 2013. So far, however, it's been uh, NATO, no action, talk only. Um, the real NATO, uh, as it happens, is doing just the opposite, no talk, only action. And the problem has been made considerably worse by the pandemic. Unless we find effective cures to the inequality problem, we are likely to see the public trust in our governments and institutions continue to decay, debilitating our ability to combat any future crises. Unfortunately, the US and Korea stand out among the rich countries in terms of extremely high income inequality uh, with an enormous concentration at the top end of the distribution and a squeeze of the middle class. Uh, precisely because of this fact, these two countries must be most determined to tackle the inequality problem and rebuild our middle classes uh, with bold and innovative policy initiatives. I hope this conference will illuminate various aspects of the inequality problem in Korea and the US and help devise effective policy measures to address them. I look forward to learning from your presentations and discussions today and tomorrow. Once again, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to everyone 
for your willingness to participate in this policy dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Yu. Now we will begin the first session on the middle class in the 21st century in South Korea and the USA. If you have any questions during the presentation, please leave them on the YouTube chat. Your questions will be collected and addressed during the Q&A session after the presentations. Now I'd like to introduce the chair for session one, Professor Kwang Yang Shin. Professor Shin is an emeritus professor in the Department of Sociology at Chungang University, Korea. His research interest lies in social class, inequality, and welfare from a comparative perspective. He is the project manager of this research project as well. Now, without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to him. Please welcome Professor Shin. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the session on the middle class in the 21st century in South Korea and the United States. Uh, my name is uh, Kwang Yong Shin. I'm a sociologist at Chungan University in Seoul, Korea. I will be moderating this session. There are three presentations. Presenter Sarah Annie L. Kellybock, Hyun Ji Kwon, and Song Gun Lee and Hiju Shin. Before uh, we start, I have a, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any questions for the presenter, please use the chat feature in the Zoom. Each presenter today will have a total of 20 minutes. Uh, during the presentation, I will announce the time limit for each uh, presenter when five minutes and one minute uh, left. Uh, we will have a Q&A session after completion of all three uh, presentations. Uh, let's move along to the session. Uh, please welcome the first uh, presenter, Annie L. Kellyberg, who will be speaking to us on rebuilding the middle class political economy, technological change, and the future of work. Uh, he is a Canon uh, Distinguished Professor at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He served as a president of the American Sociological Association. And currently, he has been serving as an editor-in-chief of International Journal Social Forces. He wrote more than 20 uh, books on work and labor. Uh, please welcome Professor Annie L. Kellyberg. Thank you very much, Professor Shin. Um, and um, thank you for having me uh, as part of this uh, very interesting uh, dialogue. I will now um, share my screen or try to. Uh, Could everybody? No, they don't see it yet. Okay. Um, everybody see that? Okay. Yep. So the, the title of my talk, as Professor Shin said, is Rebuilding the Middle Class, Political Economy, Technological Change, and the Future of Work. And I'm going to divide my presentation into three parts. Uh, first, I will provide an overview of the American middle class, focusing on the period since the 1970s, which, which is the time when the middle class in the United States started to stagnate. I will then discuss various explanations for this stagnation, and this will lead to um, my final part, which is to talk about policies for rebuilding the American middle class, many of which policies are relevant to Korea as well. Um, before I do that, though, I should point out that it's very difficult to define the middle class, uh, and uh, it has always been that way. Um, sociologists have always uh, found it a bit of a 
difficulty identifying the boundaries of it. Um, a nice quote that I've got from Mauro Guillen in his book, uh, 2030, uh, talks about the middle class as being that large segment of people who are neither affluent nor destitute. Um, he argues that um, our modern understanding of the middle class goes back to uh, a British government report from 1913 which defined it as people who are neither upper class nor traditionally working class. Uh, and since then, what's happened um, in Western countries has been broadening this idea of what the middle class is. Uh, and it has been in the last 50 years or so, there's been a, a shrinking of the middle class. Uh, I should also note that uh, middle class could be defined uh, not only as an objective uh, characteristic, which I will do, I will define it mainly in terms of income, but it also is a feeling, a sense that you um, are um, full of possibilities and that you um, have the opportunity uh, to uh, achieve upward mobility. So it's a feeling as well as a, um, uh, a objective state. And uh, I believe this a subjective aspect of things will be something that speakers will talk about tomorrow. So the first point I wanted to make here is represented by this slide, which shows that um, in the United States, it was, it was the period of the late 1970s when there started to be a um, a dis, uh, the 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 where the productivity of of the country, which is measured in GDP per capita, uh, the middle class, which I'm defining here as the middle forty percent, started to not keep up with the rate of productivity. On the other hand, the top one percent. Of, and these are market incomes of working age adults in the United States. So it's basically a labor market kind of approach. I'm not looking at households here because my focus is mainly on work and, uh, and jobs. But, but basically since the late 1970s, what you've had is the, uh, the top 1% and the top one and the top 10% have obtained incomes that were larger than the productivity in the country, whereas the middle class has not kept up with productivity gains. Uh, in fact, um, since this period here, it's really, for the last uh, 30 years, it's been fairly constant, stagnant, and it has not kept up with economic growth. Uh, though the middle class, the middle 40%, does have uh, advantages over the bottom half of the uh, way of the income distribution. Uh, and all of this is to say that there has been a growing inequality in incomes in the United States, whereby the middle class um, has been uh, disadvantaged with regard to the top 10%, though it has been, dis has been advantaged with regard to the bottom 50%. Now, so therefore that's the big picture. Middle class uh, has been stagnant in terms of income si uh, since the late 1970s in the United States. Um, I will now uh, provide you with a sort of a breakdown, uh, what we might call the structure of American wage inequality. And now I'm shifting to wages. Um, and I should say that uh, uh, any definition of the middle class is got to be to some extent arbitrary uh, because uh, many definitions do abound. This is a, um, a way of breaking up the uh, wage structure in terms of uh, labor market segments that I uh, have worked on with a co an economist colleague of mine, David Howell. 
uh, who would, teaches at the New School uh, in New York City. And basically uh, what we did was, um, was to define uh, a fundamental boundary between what we might call the decent wage segment and the low wage segment. Think of this as the primary sector of the labor, for, uh, labor force, and this is the secondary segment of the labor force. Uh, this cutoff here, the decent wage cutoff, is two thirds of the mean wage for full time workers uh, in this particular year. I'm focusing now on prime age workers. Um, and so uh, this is cuts off as, as two thirds of the mean wage. What differentiates the bottom, the very bottom of the labor force uh, uh, from, from what we might call the uh, upper uh, contour of the secondary labor market uh, as, uh, as two thirds of the median uh, income for uh, uh, wages for uh, full-time workers. Uh, and this cutoff here is uh, up to 50% of, uh, of this decent wage cutoff. So basically what we've done here is divide the labor force into these four groups. Um, you can combine these two middle groups um, and uh, without much loss of, and this is what I would consider to be the middle class, the second and third uh, contours here. Now, uh, while this is based on wages, I should point out that uh, non-wage quality of jobs uh, shows uh, no meaningful compensating wage differenti or differentials. And what happens is that these kinds of jobs are not only disadvantaged with regard to wages, but they're also disadvantaged with regard to other qualities of jobs. For example, um, uh, these kinds of jobs, the, the top and the top versus the, the bottom, uh, differ enormously in the degree to which they're provided health insurance from their employer, which is a big factor in the United States, given that we do not have a system of um, of universal uh, health care at this point. Um, it also, and we're, uh, jo uh, jobs in this primary segment also have much more paid time off uh, and they have, they're much more likely to have regular and uh, stable work. Uh, these groups are also uh, much more unionized uh, than uh, these jobs here. So for example, the lower tier of the uh, decent wage uh, contour has about 17% of the uh, are unionized compared to about 13% here and compared to about 7% here. So unionization does parallel the kinds of, of um, boundaries that I'm drawing here. What this goes to, what the, the short and the long of this is that I, I do believe that this kind of breakdown of the labor force is a reasonable approximation to uh, some of the major, fa uh, major cleavages in American society right now, and especially the, uh, the middle class. Now, if we look at um, uh, trends in, the, uh, in these four contours over time, what we see is that the, the dark blue bars are the, the, best the best jobs, the upper primary jobs. Uh, and they have remained fairly constant over this period at about 33% of the labor force. The lowest, uh, the lowest contour, which is the yellow bars, um, have also uh, been fairly uh, within a narrow band, about 25 to 28% of the labor force. And so the top, the best jobs and the worst jobs in the American economy have remained relatively stable in terms of relative wages. Uh, and so has the middle class has remained about 40% uh, of the labor force during that period. But what's happened is that the composition of the, of the middle class group has changed a bit. Whereas, and this is the, um, the upper, the, the lower, part of the primary market, 
uh, jobs that are what, what have been called the subordinate primary market, jobs that are fairly semi-autonomous. We're talking supervisors, secretaries, administrative assistants, and so on, has declined somewhat uh, over time. And there's been an increase in what we might call the lower, um, the lower, the upper part of the secondary labor market has increased. So there's been a sort of a shift in the uh, in the um, in in the composition of the middle class, a homogenization, if you will, between uh, jobs that were um, uh, once uh, better than the others, but homogenization produced by things like automation, and 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 I'll get that in a minute. So. What, what's happened over time, so the evidence does suggest that there has been a polarization of the um, American uh, wage structure and job structure over this period. Uh, and uh, it's reflected here nicely in a paper by Rachel Dwyer and Eric Wright, which who basically what they did was they um, they divided the um, the period from 1983 to 2017 into um, into periods of expansion in the labor market uh, and 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 recession. So the 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 bars going up are the expansionary periods. The bars going down are the um, are the uh, recessionary periods. And what uh, we see here is that. Uh, the, and what they did was at the beginning of each period, they, uh, they divided the uh, job structure defined as occupation by industry uh, cells and took the, um, the, median income, the median income of that cell and ranked them and divided them into three parts, terciles, and, saw, and then looked at how those terciles changed over the period. And we see that during the, uh, especially during the 2000s, there has been a growth during expansions of the top and the bottom terciles. You can see it clearly here, um, but a not so fast growth in the, um, in the middle tercile, which is what I would consider the middle class. Uh, and during the recessionary period of the Great Recession, the middle class jobs actually lost the most kinds of jobs. So this to me indicates that um, there has been a, a fairly robust pattern of job polarization over time in the United States. And I think at this point, it is fairly well recognized that job polarization, and by that I mean the growth in the top and the bottom and a decline or slower growth in the middle is characteristic of not only the United States, uh, but many, many uh, other uh, advanced countries. So to um, provide a summary for my conclusions about the, uh, the, the uh, American middle class, what I would say is that uh, the incomes of the top 10% have increased relative to the middle 40%, and the gap between the middle 40% and the bottom has grown. The size of the middle class in terms of its income shares, employment shares, uh, has been relatively stagnant. Um, but there has been a, a shift in the um, in the composition of the middle class, a decline in the lower tier of the primary sector and a increase in the upper tier of the secondary sector. And in the lower tier of the primary sector, it is more heavily unionized, much more likely to have regular and steady work and much more likely to have a uh, paid time off and, um, and health insurance. Now, what explains this? Well, there are two dominant explanations for it. The first is the uh, traditional mainstream economic approach, which basically argues that increasing pay inequalities 
is due to the fact that employer demands for cognitive skills have increased. And this is driven by something called routine bias technological change. In other words, um, jobs that could be routinized through computers uh, have been done so. And, um, and, and so those jobs have higher educational requirements. And so the fact that some jobs now, th there's an increased demand for high-end workers, high-end high educated workers, but the problem here is that there, the supply of these highly educated workers has not kept pace with the, um, with the demand for them, leading to this growing inequality between, um, between uh, the high and the low and the decline in the middle. I should also mention- Five minutes this, left. Okay, I should mention in this regard though, that, um, that the, key, uh, the key divider in the labor force on the labor force side is education. And educated people are much better off than um, the non-educated people. The alternative explanation is, not, is that it's not so much technology and trade, tech, international trade is the other factor here. Uh, rather, it's the, um, the shift in, in the balance of bargaining power between employers and workers for different parts of the earnings distribution. And so as a result, decline of unions here is a major factor. Um, uh, couple that with other institutional changes, such as uh, the greater monopsony, uh, the purchasing power of, to get workers of firms and monopoly power of firms have increased. So this is an institutional explanation for um, uh, what's going on, which is very different. Now, what's important about these two different explanations is that they do have different implications uh, for policy, which I think is the main purpose of this dialogue. Um, many of the reasons for middle-class stagnation and decline are rooted not in the shortage of jobs or the quality of workers, but in the quality of jobs that employers offer. Now, if you were to, now one of the uh, factors that both perspectives agree on is the importance of education and skills. Um, because from the, the RBTC point of view, if the reason for the, for the, uh, for the growth of inequality is uh, the lack of sufficient education, then we need to help people obtain those skills and education. But this is also um, consistent with a political economy theory approach, which also recognizes the importance of providing individuals with the skills and education needed to obtain uh, jobs, to obtain the good jobs that will be created. Where they differ is that the political economy explanations also emphasize the importance of institutional changes, in particular, the necessity of enhancing collective worker bargaining power in providing middle-class jobs. We need institutional changes in order for these, um, for the middle class to be rebuilt. And we're talking about institutional changes such as uh, uh, changing labor laws to recognize the, uh, the changes that have occurred in the nature of work, um, increasing the federal minimum wage, providing uh, an environment in which collective bargaining is, mo is more possible and uh, encouraged uh, rather than uh, thinking of reasons why you should not provide um, them with uh, collective bargaining power. No matter what we do though, it seems that not only, this is not only a labor market issue, it's also a welfare uh, policy issue. And um, in order to rebuild the working class, we need to rebuild the safety net that uh, has not really uh, been very um, uh, helpful for the middle class in recent years. And so what we need to do, it seems to me, is decouple many of the uh, basic uh, welfare protections uh, from the employment status. 
working in uh, the, the, the kinds of jobs that we see in the, uh, that used to be middle-class jobs that might not be so good now. Um, uh, there's nothing really wrong with these jobs, but, they, but the fact that they don't provide um, sufficient wages to provide a, a, a quality of life, don't provide health insurance and so on, uh, is, a, is a crucial, crucial factor. So in conclusion, let me just say that um, uh, the middle class in the United States has stagnated, uh, if not uh, declined since the late 1970s. Uh, and the future of, of, uh, of the middle class depends a great deal on the uh, evolution of, uh, of forms of work and work arrangements. Um, trends such as automation, digitalization, um, uh, and technological change and, and this kind of thing uh, are going to be important, uh, but they're not exogenous uh, and they're heavily shaped by uh, political, eco uh, political economy and cultural contexts. Uh, and uh, so it really requires, and none of this is going to happen though, unless workers will be able to um, obtain collective bargaining power uh, to re to, re to reshift the uh, balance between uh, employers and uh, employees. So thank you very much. Uh, let's welcome our final uh, presenter, uh, Sang Yul Lee and He Ju Shin. Uh, Sang Yul Lee is a, a professor of sociology at Ulsan University. He has been doing research on labor, inequality, and welfare. He served as a vice president of the Korean Sociological Association. Uh, he Ju Shin uh, is a professor of sociology at Catholic University. She has been working on inequality, poverty, gender, and health. Uh, they will speak to us on the changes in the economic condition of the Korean middle income group in the 2010s. Please welcome Professor Sang Yul Lee and Hee Ju Shen. So the main focus of my presentation today is whether the middle income group is still in the Korean inequality structure. So first, I will explain why we have examined the middle income group to understand the middle class in Korea as a research background. Second, I will talk about the proportion and economic influence of the middle income group in terms of income share and wealth share, and especially the housing issues of the middle income group. Final one is the answer to the original question, whether the middle income group is squeezed in Korea, in what sense? So, okay, let's begin with our research background. Many experts said that recent economic inequality created a crisis for the middle class. For example, the OECD published a paper in 2019 titled Under Pressure, the Squeezed Middle Class. It says that proportion and aggregate income of the middle income households have decreased in many countries. The main reason was the changing labor market, where the number of precarious workers increased. With regard to the household finance, over indebtedness, is higher for the middle income group, especially the young generation than low and high income households. However, in another paper by OECD, you can also find the natural variations of the proportion and its trend. There are many countries on the screen Korea is here in the middle of the graph and OECD average is in the right side, but dark dot and bar graph all say the some timing the middle class. So the proportion of middle income group differs by country and period. So another example is the Japanese case. After the OECD report, Japanese experts 
published a paper saying that the share of the American goal was 65% and has not decreased compared to the Fed. Then what about the Korean case? The Korea is here in the middle of the graph, but the paper does not examine the detailed story of the Korean middle income group. So this is the starting point of our research. Is the Korean middle income group under pressure like many OECD countries, or does it show a stable trend like Japan? What is the main issue in the income and wealth inequality for the Korean middle income group? So to find the answer, we have analyzed the Korean data. First, we define the middle income group as the OECD does That's in the same way, the 75 through 200% group of the national median equivalized disposable income. Equivalized disposable income here is the total income of a household after tax and other deduction that is available for spending or saving divided by the number of household members. So this concept of household income is different from individual wage for income. We also use three subsectors of the middle income group to see the internal differentiation, the lower sector, mid sector and higher sector of the middle income group. So, the, so okay, let's see the research outcome in the screen. The first part is the income share of the middle income group. In Korea, income inequality has been maintained at a certain level or has been slightly decreased. For example, the Gini coefficient changed from about 0.38 in 20, to 0.32 in 2020. So you can see the two, two graphs on the screen. That is the outcome of our empirical research. The first one is the composition of three income groups, low income group, middle income group, high income group, out of the total household. The second one on the right side is the economic share of the three subsectors of the middle income group in terms of aggregate income share of the total national income. So the proportion on the right side graph of middle income group remained very constant. The red line the, of the left side graph indicating the total middle income group remained at about 50% of the all households for 10 years. The blue dot line, the high income group also shows the, almost the same trend. In the right side graph, economic share, that is the aggregate income share of the middle income group slightly increased from 50 to 52 in 2020. The blue bar for higher sector, the red one for the middle sector, white one for the lower sector, all figures show the similar trends of aggregate income share. So temporarily, we could argue that at least in terms of the income share, the middle income group was not squeezed for 10 years in Korea. So now I want to show the composition of middle income group by employment position, because uh, the previous two presenters said much about the labor market and employment position, I skip them, but I would like to say in general, labor market flexibility widened the wage gap. In Korea, wage gap between regular and precarious workers increased. Also, we should understand that the trends of homogamy, it means the household is composed of the members in a similar employment position. This implies that the total household income and the chance of being middle income group depends on the employment positions of all household members, husband, wife, and other members. Mm -hmm. So in the analysis, we made several types of household, but I will show you the only the six types for clarity. Type one is the household with only one regular employee. Type two is the household with only one non-regular employee. Type four is the household with two regulars. Type five is the household with two non-regulars. So we can compare their 
income gap and the, the income shares. The, the graph on the screen shows the total household income gap by six types. So if you compare type one and two, type four and five, you can find the total household income with regular employees higher than that of the household with non-regular or continual workers. So the chance of being middle income group also depends on the household type. The chance is more than 60% in case of household type one with one regular, whereas it is 37% for the household type two. So now let's compare the household type four and five with two regulars and two non-regulars. So comparing the trends of homogamy, we could easily understand the chance of being middle income group and high income group is higher in type four than type five. So one final one to note in the graph is the economic decline of the household with self-employed person. We know the sample employed in Korea is very small size and their sales, profit and business income declined in the late 2010. This is why their chance of being middle income group or high income group is lower than the household type with the two regular. So just compare the sum of 38, 5, 57 in type four and the sum of 22 and 66 in type six. So you can compare the household with the right regulars and self-employed persons. So another factor to explain the middle income group is the welfare institutions such as pension program for the old age. In Korea, it is well known that old age has much higher poverty rate. In our data, old age poverty continued in the 2010. The low income group composed the majority of the 60s and more. At the same time, the old age poverty rate decreased in the period, and the chance of old age to be middle income group increased in our data. The red one is the middle income group. So the proportion of middle income group in the age of 60s and more was about 30% in 2011 but it increased to 40% in 2020. But at the same time, we, I would like to say most of them are lower mid-sector of the middle income group. So why? Why the proportion of old age increased in Korea in 2010? So I interpret that the main reason was the increase is the income security program for the retired old age. In Korea, the total amount of the public transfer income, including old age benefits and poor support benefits, increased 1.4 times in the period 2017 through 2020. The number of the national pension beneficiary out of the total old age also increased. So as a result, pension beneficiary had more chance of being the middle income group after retirement. This is why the composition of the middle income group within the old age increased in Korea in the 2010s. But the low replacement rate of pension program led to the increase of old age into lower or mid sector of the middle income group. So the second part is our research is the issue of wealth inequality for the middle income group. We know wealth inequality is higher than income inequality in many countries. In Korea, Gini coefficient of wealth was about 0.6 in the 2010. That is two times higher than the income coefficient. In our data, the share of the middle income group has been around 20% of the total wealth. The figures contrast to the middle income group's income share, that is about 50%. Within the middle income group, the wealth share of the lower sector is only 3%. And Five minutes left. 
share of the higher sector is less than 10%. All the figures are much lower than if the income share. So I also would like to tell you now temporarily just that uh, the wealth share of the middle income group began to decrease after the mid 2010s in the graph. I'll explain the story later. Now, let's return to the OECD paper to understand the changing lifestyle of the middle class. The paper emphasized the housing issues to explain the squeezed middle class. The cost of essential parts of the middle class lifestyle, especially housing price, have increased faster than inflation. So we need to examine the house price of the middle income group in Korea. This is the major factor of wealth gap growth in Korea. First, uh, about more than half of the Korean household own the house, but the ownership rate of house is different by income level. In 2016, more than 70% of a high income group, that is top 20% of the income distribution own the house. But the rate is 59% for the middle income class and 64% for the low income class. Second, Koreans saw the surge of housing price by the second half of the 2010s. Consumer price changed by 10%, but the nationwide apartment sale price increased by 25%. And the apartment price in Seoul increased by 73% at the same period. At the same time, the monthly rent or deposit price also increased in Korea. So the third led to the gap in the chance of buying house by income class. The PIR, the table on the screen, the price to income ratio is a good example of the housing issues for the middle income group. It means how much each household should save all of their annual income without consuming anything to purchase the house. So let, let's see the figures of PIR before and after the mid 2010s when the wealth share of the middle income group began to decrease. So you can see on the table when some income group, for example, the third income group, how much should they should spend all of their income to buy some price group of house, like third price group. So it was in 2014, it was 3.8, but it increased to 4.1 in 2019. If they want to buy yeah, upper middle price house in 2014, it was 5.5. But it increased to 6.3. This is why the household finance of the middle income group is unstable in Korea. Non owners within the middle income group should pay higher housing expenses for their family life, like monthly rent or deposit. So we calculated the household finance structure and made a graph like this. Blue bar is the percent of the housing expenditure out of total household expenditure. So the, the, the total middle income group spend 13% of their household expenditure only for housing. The, the figure is higher in the lower middle sector and then the higher of the middle income group. So 15.2 versus 11.5 within the middle income group. Second result, the red bar, is the house price or the effect of household house price increase on over indebtedness. So we calculate the loan for housing out of total household loan. So if the middle income group want to buy a house or provide deposit, a huge amount of deposit, they should rely on the housing loan from the financial institution. One minute left. Yes. 
Yeah, so they, they had very high levels of that ratio that the lower their actual household disposable income for a table with a class lifestyle. The final one is the generation gap of the middle income group. So we made two graphs. You can see the two graph gap of net wealth by income group and age. The next one is gap of real estate, housing asset by income group and age. We have very similar one. So lower income group uh, has very low value of their house, housing asset than other groups. The middle income group has in the middle of the low and high. But the most important one is the death ratio by the young generation. So we see the reverse one. In every income group and within the middle income group, the young persons of ages 30 or less have higher debt ratio for housing loans than middle or old age. So the debt ratio is 29.7 for the young lower sector of the middle income group in the bar graph. It represents the height of indebtedness of the Korean young middle income groups for the housing issue. So given the time constraint, I do finish my presentation for the conclusion. I do answer to the question the OECD reports. Does the middle class look like a boat in a rocky world in Korea? Unfortunately, my answer is yes. The economic issue of middle income group is clear in wealth inequality rather than income inequality. The proportion of the economic influence of middle income group does not decrease, but the uh, sharp increase of housing price led to the wealth gap between high income group and middle income group, especially the middle income non-owners or the young persons found the pressure for, for the housing issue. Recently, after the COVID-19 pandemic, the central bank continuously raised key interest rates to respond to consumer inflation. It is same as the American context. So when wealth inequality and housing loans during the times of interest rate hike would force the middle income group to be more squeezed out of the middle class lifestyle in the near future. Okay, that's the end of my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much for all an excellent presentation. Uh, from now on, uh, we will have a Q&A session for uh, eight, 17 minutes. So uh, there is a no uh, question and or comments for three presenters. So uh, we will uh, freely uh, discuss the uh, main issue and we share some ideas. And first of all, uh, thank you to all presenters today. And uh, so we can uh, exchange our ideas and some uh, sharing some uh, questions together. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to raise some uh, questions to uh, Ani and uh, Professor Lee. There seems to be uh, some uh, commonality between uh, South Korea and the United States in terms of uh, the changing uh, features of the life of the middle class. Uh, nevertheless, there seems to be some uh, differences in terms of uh, some uh, scale or degree and also some um, differences in the issue of uh, housing price. In Korea, uh, for the last uh, three years, housing price uh, became a most important 
social and political issue. Some influencing the uh, uh, presidential election. So that might happen uh, in, in the United States in 2008 or before 2008, right? So uh, what's the uh, some uh, impact of that kind of uh, uh, some um, housing bubble on the uh, life of the middle class after the fi financial crisis in 2008 in the United States? Well, it has had an impact in the United States too, of course. Um, after the uh, the Great Recession uh, and, the, and the housing bubble burst, uh, it became much harder to get um, to get loans. Um, uh, and housing prices have have increased uh, dramatically uh, in uh, for the middle class in the United States as well. So. Um, uh, and especially, uh, um, and more and more um, people are deciding to rent rather than to buy, and rents have gone up as well. So this has become a, um, I, I don't know if it's quite the, the, had the impact in the United States as it has in Korea, but it certainly has impacted the uh, ability of uh, middle class people, at least to enter the middle class uh, and get started. Uh, has had a huge uh, effect. Thank you. Um, can you add uh, something to Ani's answer, please? Professor uh, Lane Kenworth, can you add something? Yeah, I I I fully agree. I mean, it, I, I guess I would just provide one additional little bit of nuance, which is that the housing unaffordability problem in the United States is heavily geographic, geography specific. So it's very much concentrated in the big cities. There are lots of places across the country where housing remains very affordable. And until very recently, interest rates were really, really low. So it was quite affordable. But uh, at the same time, like in a lot of other rich democratic countries, many people have wanted to move into these cities, which are much safer than they were in the 1970s and 1980s. They're much more interesting places to live. That's where a lot of other uh, young people uh, live and so consequently want to be, and maybe most important of all, at least until the COVID uh, pandemic, they were the site of lots of professional analytical jobs, the kind of high paying, interesting jobs that most college educated Americans wanted to end up having. And so even though in principle, you could afford to, to, to buy a house in lots of parts of the country, they weren't the kinds of places that uh, millennial and Gen Z members, uh, cohort members wanted to, to, to live. Let me just add to that, uh, uh, which I totally agree with. Um, the, actually, the COVID pandemic has really uh, made it easier because of the ability to telecommute and to, uh, ha has enabled people to move to areas that were um, not as expensive for housing. Uh, uh, and they, they, ha they could move out of the the central cities, and uh, as a result, um, actually, COVID was a good thing in that in that way because it did change the way we work. Uh, and this is probably going to have some sort of uh, um, lasting effect. Okay, uh, do you expect uh, a change uh, taking place during the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, will continue or uh, in the near future? In, um, in many uh, companies in South Korea, they uh, are going to return to the past uh, workplace, uh, uh, some uh, types of uh, uh, work and uh, some uh, pra uh, business practice. So there seems to be a, some kind of uh, uh, some uh, ongoing debate 
the some uh, feasibility of the new types of work uh, developed during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, in South Korea. So do you expect it will continue? Uh, well, this, it's, it's very, uh, uh, many companies want people to come back for a period of time. I and mean, there's actually there's a crisis in office space and so on because it's going vacant in many cases. So I think workers are resistant to going back full time, full year. I, I think they the, the best that companies are going to be able to do is to get a, get workers back maybe three three days a week or so on. So I I think we're we're seeing a, a move toward uh, people not being in the office for five days a week now. Uh, and I think Americans are pretty resistant to uh, going back full time. And and given the tight labor market that we have, uh, employers really can't um, force people that as easily as they could to do that uh, because they they need them. Okay, thank you. All three presenters, uh, uh, some important argument. The first thing is that the middle class is not unified. It is diverse and uh, stratified. And then uh, there was that uh, some, uh, some utility of the concept of the middle class. Uh, instead of, uh, we might use the concept of middle strata. So when we uh, talk about some uh, upper class or a uh, ruling class, uh, we assume very homogeneous and unified in terms of orientation, culture, and behavior, and consumption pattern, lifestyle. And uh, when we talk about the middle class, uh, we found that middle class is so diverse in terms of income, in terms of work style, lifestyle, and some also uh, within the middle class, there is a gender division and some generational uh, disparity so many diverse, uh, some uh, heterogeneity. So how can we uh, uh, justify when we use the term middle class to identify or to find out some a trend of a social change? So it's a, it's a kind of a conceptual or theoretical <laughs> issue. But we don't have a proper uh, some term to uh, depict some middle strata. So we commonly used the term, the middle class, right? <laughs> sometimes. So it sometimes uh, produces uh, interesting uh, some uh, questions about the uh, utility of the term of the middle class. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's, that's right. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if the, the term middle class ever was all that useful. I mean, it was always defined in relation to the two extremes. And uh, uh, it's, it's so, but I, I, I think middle strata is really more apt in many ways. Uh, okay, it's a, uh, it's a perennial <laughs> issue <laughs> among uh, sociologists. <laughs> I want to respond to uh, Jennifer's question here uh, on uh, I, I think this uh, this move toward green uh, green jobs and 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 this kind of thing is really a tremendous opportunity for rebuilding the middle class because these are the kinds of jobs that uh, are going to they're going to be well paying they're going to be in high demand um, they require. Uh, a, a, a good level of skill, but it doesn't require necessarily a college education. So, you know, I think this is a terrific opportunity to to, to rebuild the middle class, and uh, uh, and I, I think that's a terrific uh, a suggestion. 
Well, I guess I'm not sure whether there is a particular government policy about the transition yet, uh, because you know the government policy is really concentrated, or maybe they actually misunderstood the opportunities. Uh, they are actually kind of taking it as a re uh, restructuring kind of you know uh, policy. Uh, they want to kind of save the uh, people who are actually dropped uh, by the transition. Uh, um, so uh, there is not much kind of you know positive. Um, you know, or in, in, in I'm sorry, institutional engagement in the transition, uh, you know, by the government, uh, you know, taking place. Uh, but you know, you know, market, yes, um, in the kind of you know, in some markets, uh, there are some kind of significant uh, changes or transition or efforts uh, taking place, but not much. And in the manufacturing sector, there are you know, a lot of risks uh, taking place, uh, especially in the automobile industry or others. So I just wanted to add. Uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, questions uh, from Professor Lane Kenorsi. This might be a question to Professor uh, Song Yun Lee. Yes. Uh, uh, he wrote that. From the two presentations on South Korea, the key policy challenges is to make housing more affordable. Is that right? Yes. What else uh, would you suggest? Yeah, housing issue is very important to the middle income groups, non owners. So the key of the policy is providing huge amount of house with affordable price. Not the price is important, but the, the, the affordable price is very important. How the government subsidize for the housing issue. The second one is very stable income in the labor market or welfare program. So this is why I emphasize the proportion of all days decrease in Korea because they began to receive pension or some poor support programs. So if they continue their income from the government, like welfare institution, they could manage their life. This is another aspect of their life, middle-class life. So in the public sector, housing issue is very important. In the labor market or some welfare institutions, we need to provide more basic or universal welfare benefits to the population. Okay, uh, time is up and uh... Uh, thank you uh, to all presenters today, and uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, from now on, I'd like to uh, wrap up. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a productive session. We will now take a short 10-minute break and resume the session at 10.40. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, welcome to the second session of New Challenges for the Middle Class. The chair for our second session is Professor Arne Kalleberg. Arne Kalleberg is a professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He has published extensively on topics related to sociology of work, organizations, occupations, industries, labor markets, and social stratification. He also served as the president of the American Sociological Association from 2007 to 8, and is currently the editor of Social Forces, an international journal focused on social research. Please welcome Professor Kalleberg. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to this second session in the um, in this dialogue. Um, I will um, chair the session, and I uh, I will let the speakers know when there's five minutes to go and one minute to go. Um, the first speaker in this session is Professor Kwang Young Shin, who is a um, fe uh, fellow at Shuangang University. Uh, Professor Shin uh, had, has had an illustrious career studying inequality uh, and um, stratification issues. Uh, he received his PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and um, his talk today will be The Captive Middle Class, 
rising debt and volatility of the middle class in South Korea. Welcome, Kwang Young. Well, thank you. And uh, today uh, I will talk about some kind of issue uh, on the debt and volatility of the middle class in South Korea. And first of all, uh, I would like to talk about some conceptual uh, issue on the middle class. Uh, as the previous uh, presenters discussed, the concept of middle class uh, is not uh, so clear. Uh, nevertheless, it is a, a useful term to describe some social changes. Uh, in sociology, a work-based approach has been a predominant, and uh, John Gorsop and Wright used the concept of uh, the middle class based on uh, work relations. In uh, economics, income-based approach has been uh, dominant. As Professor Sang Yun Lee uh, described uh, in the previous session, OECD uh, used the uh, income as a basis for uh, the middle class. And so uh, the issue is not some kind of conceptual issue, but rather empirical issue uh, where uh, to uh, cut the lower uh, limit and upper limit of the uh, middle class. So uh, OECD uh, defined the middle class uh, ranged from 75% uh, of the median income to 200 of percent of the median income. Some other uh, economists uh, used uh, the lower cut, cut off to 75 and the upper uh, cut off to 100 25% instead of uh, 200. So uh, it's a matter of some uh, cutting point. Uh, recently, uh, Thomas Piketty defined the middle class from the perspective of wealth or property. He identifies the middle class as the middle 40 uh, between 50 to 90% of income distribution. So the definition of the middle class varies a lot according to the disciplines and scholars. So it depends on some also some researchers' definition and purpose for using the concept of the middle class. I will rely on. Uh, income to discuss the middle class for two reasons. Uh, one is some occupational status does not fully uh, uh, reflect the kind of well-being uh, due to the rise of non-standard employment. Another is the rise of a normal working population due to aging. The rapid growth of elderly alter the income distribution in South Korea. Thus, we uh, find some limitation in the discussion of inequality if we focus on working population only. Therefore, the unit of the middle class is not individual working in the labor market, but household are living together. Uh, traditionally, uh, sociologists assume the alignment of occupation, income, and social status. However, uh, we have observed increasing de-alignment or a decoupling between occupation and income, between employment and social status due to the increased revenue from other uh, than work. 
So I will focus in this uh, presentation on the death of the middle class. Indebtedness of the middle class become a new social problem as the interest uh, skyrocket, a personal bankruptcy and shrinking uh, middle class might be uh, expected. So now uh, let's take a look at the figure uh, showing proportion of debt by income quantiles in South Korea. So it's a, a 20, 20th income quantile. It's a 5% uh, interval from lowest 5 to uh, richest 5%. So proportion of that shows the higher income, the higher debt ratio, except for the lowest 5% income quantile. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, figure uh, showing the high, higher income, the higher debt, except the lowest 5%. So the upper middle class is more likely to borrow money uh, in 2020 than 2010. The lowest income group shows a higher proportion of debtor than other lower income group. It's a very uh, uh, peculiar figure uh, showing the relationship between the proportion of debtor and uh, uh, income uh, level. Uh, this figure shows the household debt to disposable income ratio across OECD uh, countries. The highest indebtedness ratio appears in Nordic countries. Most of welfare spending is concentrated on the old and the young. People take in, into more debt when they are young they need more expenses in education, housing, and child caring. They pay off when they grow old. So that is related to the lifestyle of the people. The better the labor market and education protection, the higher the personal debt in Nordic countries. So uh, in Nordic countries, that is an investment for the young. In South Korea, that works as an investment as a Bank of Korea low interest rate. But the meaning of that varies according to income quantiles. So here, uh, the debt ratio, DTI ratio was highest among the lowest 5% income group. So that is burden for the lower income class. Here, uh, the DTI uh, differs from the DTI used by uh, creditors. It refers to the household debt to the disposable income. So there, are, uh, I will use two different types of uh, DTI. Here, uh, the DTI uh, refers to the ratio of household debt to the disposable income. So uh, low income class shows a very high a level of uh, DTI uh, ratio. It means that uh, they are really suffering from the debt. They cannot uh, repay uh, those debt. So it's, they might be, they uh, experience very serious uh, problems in managing their life. The next figure displays that the DTI ratio diminish as income increases. The DTI shows an inverse relationship with the level of income. Thus the lower middle class next to the poor shows a high DTI ratio from three to over four, which is a dangerous level of debt. 
Although uh, the DTI ratio diminishes in, as income increases, the middle class DTI ratio continuously exceed over two. So, uh, so two uh, is an important some uh, boundary. The middle class has taken uh, more debt from uh, 2010 to 2020. Uh, in, in particular, the upper middle class shows a higher rate of debt than the lower uh, middle class. However, the usual uh, debt to income used by financial institutions indicate the lower middle class shows more vulnerability than the upper middle class. The usual definition of DTI is a ratio of repayment amount to disposable income. The bank used to set 28% of the front end DTI ratio as a criteria of the financial health of household. Uh, the following figure uh, portrays the subjective, let's see. Uh, this figure uh, shows the subjective evaluation of difficulty in repayment. Uh, remember that the gray line represents 20, 2020 when the interest rate was lowest in Korean history. Uh, nevertheless, more than 20% of the lower middle class responded as experiencing difficulty in repaying the debt. The interest uh, rate set by the Bank of Korea last week was 2.5%. Uh, it was 20% in 1998 when South Korea experienced a financial crisis. Uh, we expect the interest rate will rise much higher than 5% soon. The lower class will be damaged immediately, uh, mostly, oh, sorry. Mostly they are old with low income. Uh, here you can see the average age by income quantile. Uh, low income uh, quantiles, we can identify the average age is around 70 and mid-60. So, uh, so elderly uh, people in South Korea uh, might experience very uh, serious problem of poverty, according to uh, this uh, figure. So, uh, Mostly, they are old with low income. The average age of the lowest 5% of income quantile is almost 70. The low middle class also will be damaged since the average age is much higher than the upper middle class. It implies that low middle class does not have much financial capacity because their average is close to 60. The income grows to the peak at 50 and drastically fall after that in South Korea. Uh, five minutes. Okay. The middle class uh, debt uh, is related with housing uh, related debt. Housing related debt includes debt for buying or renting houses or rooms. The upper middle class is more likely to get into debt than the lower uh, middle class in terms of housing related debt. I did a Tobit regression analysis to identify a determinant of debt. So effect of demographic factors on that has declined. Educational uh, disparity has been expanded. 
a professional effect on that is negligible. And there is no significant uh, difference between regular and non-regular employment. However, uh, income effect on household debt is getting larger. Middle income class is more likely to get into debt than the lower income class. Here, it, we can see that debt is considered as a leverage rather than burden for the middle income class. There is a strong and persistent wealth effect on household debt. So you can see uh, some uh, effect of income and wealth on household debt. When we consider current development in the financial market, the middle class will be engulfed by dangerous current, a housing price crash and giant step of interest rate hike. So it, uh, it suggests uh, uh, a plausible scenario. So the increase in the interest rate from 0.5% to 5% will result in the increase in the proportion of data from 26.9% uh, to 28.1%, where DTI will be above the warning line. So I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, before the summer of 2022, our indebtedness of a Korean middle class increased as they consider that as a leverage under the low interest rate. Thus we observe the higher income, the more debt, the larger wealth, the more debt. Though the lower middle class shows higher indebtedness than the upper middle class in terms of DTI. Low middle class might suffer from the burden of repayment uh, due to the rapid rising interest uh, it will continue for a while. That will speed up the shrinking middle class, generating further social polarization and pushing the lower middle class to the lower class. Uh, that's my all uh, thing to say today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kwang Yang. That was a very uh, helpful discussion. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Lane Kenworthy. Um, Lane is a professor of sociology and Yankelovich chair in social thought at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he is a very prolific author and has published uh, a number of books dealing with, um, with capitalism and socialism uh, and the welfare state. Today, he's going to talk about middle-class income growth, what to do, Lane? Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh -oh. Okay, I guess my screen is shared. Um, right, so I changed my, my original title had to do with obstacles. I changed it a little bit because I, I wanted to focus more on uh, policies and, and solutions. And so let me get right to it. Um, I wanna start by saying that I think maybe the most important thing any government in a rich democratic nation can do to help the middle class is to basically copy the Nordic policy model. There are other elements of the, the Nordic model, um, but the, the policy one, which is first and foremost, the provision of a, a really abundant array of public services, public goods, public insurance programs, some of which have already been talked about here from pensions, but there, there are lots, lots more. I think we now can be pretty confident in saying that this works very well. It uh, boosts living standards up and down the distribution. It seems to enhance economic security. It's good for equality of opportunity. It doesn't solve that problem, but it's, it helps. It's probably good for happiness or life satisfaction. And all this is doable without the kinds of trade-offs that, uh, that lots of people have worried about uh, for the last 50 years or the last 150 years. First and foremost, innovation and, and economic growth, but also things like government debt. Um, okay, so that... That's a, a really good thing to do. And it makes wages and incomes 
less important. It doesn't render them irrelevant, but it makes them less important. However, uh, I do think that we we care about incomes as well. Certainly middle class households will, even if you've got that kind of um, uh, ideal uh, Nordic policy model in place. Um, as a kind of rough approximation, I think we should we should want middle class incomes to grow roughly at the same rate as GDP per capita. That's not handed down from God or from Adam Smith or Karl Marx or anybody like that. But we know it's doable. And as a kind of rough uh, guidepost, uh, I think it's pretty sensible. Uh, I'm going to focus here on the United States, but I, I think there are implications well beyond the, the U.S. experience. OK, so he, here's the problem. And, and Arnie Kahlberg uh, outlined it nicely, I think, in his presentation. Others have alluded to it already. Since roughly the late 1970s, there's been a confluence of developments that all kind of came together roughly at the same time that have simply made it harder to achieve middle class income growth in a stereotypical affluent democratic nation. It's, uh, it's technological change, it's globalization, it's heightened product market competition, which is partly a function of those two things, but also is separate, has to do with falling barriers to entry and things like uh, low-end services, especially retail. It's in some countries a turn to a so-called shareholder value orientation in corporate governance so that management cares more about, uh, about rising stock prices than it does about workers or, or other stakeholders. Um, and it's higher unemployment rates, uh, a function mainly, at least until very recently, of central banks worrying about what happened in the late 1970s, early 1980s with the explosion of inflation. And hopefully we're not going to have another 40 years of the, the same um, prioritization of, uh, of keeping inflation low, but, but who knows? We'll see. So all of this has increased companies' incentive and also ability to resist pay increases for workers up and down the distribution, but especially those in the middle and below. And so the, the result in a country like the United States, and I, I think, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, there's some evidence that this is true in others, where labor unions are weak or weakening has been stagnant pay and slow growth of, of household incomes for the middle class. So here's the pay picture in the United States. This is just the median adjusted for inflation, hourly pay. Um, and you can see that there's been very little uh, increase. Uh, we've got good, reliable comparative data on this going back to 1973 from a, a constant data source. There's some, some other data sets you can use if you want to go back for further in time. But with the exception, and I'll come back to this, of, and I'm just going to highlight, I don't know if you can see this, the late 1990s and the late 2010s, uh, there's been essentially no growth in, in pay. So here's a, a different way of showing the picture in a number of respects. First of all, this is compensation. It's still the median, but it's compensation. So it includes employer benefits for things like pensions and, and health insurance, rather than just uh, the wage or, or the pay itself. Second, uh, I've got data here for many of the other affluent democratic nations. South Korea is not on here just because I also want to show economic growth and the relationship between these two things. And South Korea would be way off the charts here, like Ireland. Would, so Ireland also is not in this graph. But so um, the economic growth rate, growth of GDP per capita is along the horizontal, median compensation along the vertical. And the line here is just a 45 degree line. So it's showing... Uh, Excuse you know, me, how, Wayne, but... Lane, excuse me, but the, your yeah. slides aren't moving. Oh, shoot. Okay. So let me see what's happened here. Let me just stop the share and then try it again. Okay. You're seeing a different screen now? Yeah. Okay. I can see it. Good. Uh, so that was the median hourly pay that I just showed you. This is the one I was just getting to. Um, okay, economic growth, growth of, growth rate of GDP per capita. Um, this is because of limited data. This only goes from 1995 to 2013. Economic growth is on the horizontal. Median compensation growth is on the vertical. And the dashed line here is a 45 degree line. So if a country's on the line, that means that median compensation growth has been at, at the same pace as economic growth. 
Um, and what you see is the Nordic countries, so Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Norway, they're all right around this line. Um, all of those countries have strong labor unions. France and the Netherlands are pretty close. Bel sorry, Belgium is also on the line. Um, those five countries, the four Nordics and Belgium, have uh, unionization rates that are still around 60, 70, 80%. France and the Netherlands, they're much lower now, but they have a compensatory mechanism such that uh, wages that are set, wage agreements that are set in the unionized share uh, essentially um, uh, apply to most of the rest of the workforce. Those two countries also are either on or pretty close to this 45 degree line. The UK is kind of an exceptional country here because its best period over the last 40 years just happens to coincide with the limited years of data here, 1995 to 2013. All the other countries are below, and in many cases, well below the line, suggesting that growth of middle-class compensation hasn't kept up with economic growth. And the United States is one of these, as I mentioned before, South Korea isn't, isn't on the chart here just because it would be way out to the right in terms of economic growth, and you wouldn't really be able to see most of the rest of the countries. Okay, that's a second way to, to see the picture. Here's a third going back just to the United States, and this is a little bit like one of the charts that uh, Arnie showed earlier. This is um, median income growth and GDP per capita going further back in time, so back to the, the beginning of where we've got good comparative data for the United States right around the end of World War II. You can see the two things track pretty similarly up until the late 1970s, and then they begin to diverge. This is a pretty familiar chart that many of you have will have, have seen before. GDP per capita continues to grow at a slightly reduced but pretty similar pace, but now median income, and this, this would be true if we used household income too, we just don't have as long a data series for households. Um, so median income begins to fall behind. It grows, but not nearly as rapidly as the economy. And I'm going to, for time reasons, just skip over that chart. I can come back to it if you want. These are the, the potential solutions I'm going to consider. Uh, I'm not going to read this now because I'm going to go one by one through these. These are ones that I think are less likely to work. These are ones that I think are maybe more likely to work. This is just my take uh, based on what I see in the data and the experience of the United States and other rich countries. Uh, I'm going to... Also, for time reasons, I'm just going to skip over wealth and borrowing here. I'm happy to come back to it. I don't think either one are, are a, a good solution or a good substitute, I should say, for middle class income growth. It's not that they would be bad. Uh, they can help, but they're not really a solution. So ultimately, I think the, the most important explanatory factor that separates these countries and I, I, I already talked about this when I showed you that chart of economic growth and median compensation growth is the strength of labor unions. These countries all have kind of similar pressures. It's not that there's no differences between them, but globalization, automation, to some extent, shareholder value, to some extent, easing of barriers to entry in services and therefore heightened competition, all of these changes in uh, economic circumstances or economic conditions apply more or less similarly across most of these countries. One of the things that differs the most is the strength of, uh, of labor unions. So if you could get stronger unions, uh, you, you might be able to go a long way toward uh, addressing the problem of slow pay growth and, and therefore slow income growth for the middle class and below. But the, the problem essentially is this, and this is, I think, the most important chart that I have to show. Uh, it looks a little bit messy, but let me just explain it. This is just showing the unionization rate or union density, the share of employees who are members of the labor union in uh, all of these roughly 21 rich democratic nations going back to, uh, in this case, 1960. And what we see, I think, are, are three different patterns. So one is the five countries that I mentioned before, the four Nordics and Belgium. These are the so-called Ghent countries. In these countries, for idiosyncratic historical reasons, uh, access to unemployment, the unemployment insurance system hinges on, it's contingent on membership in a labor union. And these five countries have maintained pretty high rates of unionization. We used to, at least here in the United States, we used to tell a story that said that the 
the low levels, but even more so the steep decline or sharp decline in union density and the unionization rate in the United States was exceptional. And it was because of our very weak and unfavorable labor union laws. But now when you look at the data, you just can't tell that story anymore. So these other, this is 15 other countries apart from the United States summarized uh, in this dark or thick dashed line here. That's the 15 country average. So it excludes these five so-called Ghent countries. It excludes the United States. And in the period of the 60s and 70s, they did look very different from the United States. On average, unionization was going up, not massively, but a little bit in these 15 countries. But since roughly 1980, their pattern of unionization has been essentially identical to the United States. It's declined at exactly the same rate as that in the US. They started from a higher level, so they finish at a little bit higher level. But these 15 countries, Australia, Austria, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Netherlands, New Zealand, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, UK, have roughly followed the American pattern in terms of their unionization level. And that more than anything else makes me very skeptical about proposals that say, well, if we could just uh, make our, our uh, policy toward labor unionization uh, more favorable here in the United States, we'd be able to significantly increase the unionization rate. Now, I may be wrong. Uh, I hope, I very much hope that I'm wrong and that we'll see a, a new burst of unionization in the United States and these other countries. Uh, but I think this pattern, which is applied to every country except these ones that have a very distinct and uh, um, I think probably impossible to replicate or duplicate um, um, uh, institutional uh, mechanism, this so-called Ghent system rule, where you tie unemployment and access to unemployment insurance to unionization membership or union membership. Um, that makes me very skeptical about uh, labor unions coming to the rescue. Okay, so what else could we do? Uh, I'm going to have to run through these really quickly. I'm happy to elaborate on, on others, and I, I'll do so in the, the paper that I write that I'm writing. Uh, okay, so one possibility is board level representa employee representation. This is sometimes called co-determination. It's a rule whereby employees get to elect half or maybe a third. You could do this with any percentage of the boards of, uh, of directors. This, in principle, gives them more leverage, uh, regardless of the strength of the labor union, to, uh, to ask for and secure uh, faster pay increases, higher pay, uh, uh, higher, higher pay levels, and, and faster pay growth. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the evidence that we have, it's pretty limited, but, but uh, it's there and it's real. I don't think it's very supportive. So there have been careful comparisons across firms within Germany and also within Norway, uh, firms that are similar in size and structure, um, but uh, in some where the code determination or the board level employee representation uh, requirement implies and others in which it doesn't. And we, we don't see faster pay growth uh, in those where there's board level employee representation. I think Germany is a pretty useful national test case because it's a country where labor unions are now fairly weak. They're much stronger than in the US, but, but now fairly weak and the unionization rate is low, but it does have strong co-determination or board level employee representation policies. But its pay growth has been just as weak as in the United States in this this period for which we have good comparative data. Uh, reduced monopsony power. So this has gotten a lot of attention and play in the United States in the last three, four, five years. Um, I, I, I think that trying to figure out ways to, to reduce employer leverage in certain labor markets might help. Um, but this is really posited as a phenomenon of the 2000s and 2010s. And the, the thing is that the patron just doesn't look at the middle class patron anyway, doesn't look any different in the United States in the 2000s and 2010s as it did in the 80s and 90s. So I don't really see the evidence that this has uh, had an impact for middle class pay growth. Um, five minutes. Okay. Uh, faster economic growth is a very common prescription for, for dealing with slow middle class, class pay increases. But when you look across the countries, the correlation between the economic growth rate and pay growth is actually quite weak uh, when you set aside those Ghent system countries. Um, and then more fundamentally, and again, this is not widely appreciated, I think, but 
we, we simply don't have good ideas for how to increase economic growth in rich democratic nations. We've got at least 25 uh, uh, plausible influential theories. None of them are any good at all in explaining cross-country variation or overtime variation in the last 40 years among the rich democratic countries in economic growth. Increase education, another very common prescription. Um, and there's good evidence in the United States that this was strongly associated with rising middle-class wages over the period from roughly 1850 until about 1980 or so. But this was mainly a story of rising secondary school completion. And this has probably hit its ceiling in the US and many of the other rich democratic nations too. So the story now is college. But the thing is, college completions actually increased pretty steadily in the United States, maybe not as fast as it could or as we like, but it has increased pretty steadily. And furthermore, the college pay premium hasn't risen in the last two decades or so. That was the, the main source of evidence that if we could just increase college completion, you get faster middle-class pay growth. Uh, resurgence in manufacturing jobs, this too is very unlikely to happen. This is the, the picture for employment in manufacturing as the share of the working age population in the rich democratic nations. And it's been on a downward trend since 1970. You could probably do something with this and you know maybe green jobs will help, but I don't, I don't think it's really a, a likely to be a solution to the problem. I'm gonna skip over trade and immigration. I, I, I wouldn't recommend this, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so let me just say something very quickly about the four that I think could help. So one is tighter labor markets. Um, the only periods of middle class, sustained middle class pay growth in the last 40 years have been those when the unemployment rate held was held under 5% for a significant period of time. Now, significant here is still pretty short. It's a period of about four years. Uh, but these are the two, and the evidence is pretty good. The question is, uh, can we do this for long enough periods so that, uh, that you can get more than a little middle-class pay growth? Uh, will the central bank continue on this path after the resurgence of inflation now? And we don't know that how well this works in other countries. Uh, minimum wages are a potential solution here. The problem with the, the actual minimum wage is that it, it applies to a very small share of the labor force in the U.S., and its effects seem to fade out by roughly the 20th percentile of the distribution. So for this to work for the middle class, we probably need something closer to what Australia does, which is occupation specific and sector specific minimum wages. This is a, a lot of intervention into the labor market and you know, getting Americans on board with this is a, a tall order, but there's a, a proposal right now sitting in front of the California legislature to do something like this for fast food workers Maybe this is a step in the right direction. We actually did this in the United States during World War II. So there is a precedent. It's a possibility. Uh, profit sharing is a, a third, I think, uh, possible solution. It's only a partial one. Uh, it doesn't work very well for workers and firms that aren't that successful. Uh, so it's risky. Um, but it is a mechanism that explicitly ties, it, it guarantees that if your firm does well, your pay will rise over time and not, not be stagnant. And then the last one I'll just mention very quickly, because I'm almost out of time, is a, a so-called employment conditional earnings subsidy, like the earning income tax credit in the United States. Um, some version of this is now very common in the rich democratic nations. The dashed lines on this chart show the structure of the EITC, the existing structure in the United States. I think what we ought to do is something closer to this solid line, which is modeled on one that Sweden used for a while, where you still, so it's very low at low levels of earnings. So it does create em employment incentives. It, it goes up, but then instead of coming down uh, as you move into the middle class, you could just extend it at the same level throughout the middle class. It would cost more of course, but, uh, but this could work. This could help as a, as a supplement to middle-class incomes. Uh, and then, Oops, I skipped over one. To, to ensure that it grows as the economy grows, I think you probably want to index it to GDP per capita. Right now in the United States, the EITC actually is indexed to inflation, so it doesn't fall behind prices. But to allow it to, to keep up with the economy, you could index it to GDP per capita. So those are the four that I, I think would, uh, would be most likely to help in the context of a, a country with weak labor unions, which... Uh, is we're, we're now moving toward a situation where that's 
all of the rich democratic countries, except for those five that I, I highlighted earlier, unfortunately. Super, thanks a lot, Lane. That was, that was terrific. Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Su Yan Byun, who's a professor of education, demography and Asian studies at Penn State University. Um, and um, he's gonna talk, his title of his talk is Trends in Academic Achievement of Children from Middle-Class Families in the U.S. and South Korea, 1995 to 2019. Thank you. And I think you're muted. All right, sorry about that. So I just jumped into the, my presentation by saying the research aim. So in this study, I'm looking at uh, how academic achievement of children from the middle-class family, here after I call it middle-class children, have changed over time past two decades in the United States in South Korea in comparison of that of children from lower and upper middle-class families. So basically I switched it uh, the attention uh, from the um, the income or like uh, the labor market to the academic achievement and the adult and children. So why we study the uh, education? Well, just Lane mentioned that, you know, uh, highlight the importance of the education in attaining uh, middle-class society, I mean, the status. So there are a number of uh, publications highlight the importance of, of uh, education. And in academic uh, achievement is the most important predictor of the, the uh, post-secondary attainment as well as the early career outcome. So that's why we study education in academic achievement. Uh, this figure uh, uh, depicts the relationship between the family and school, which are two most important the social institutions that shape the educational outcome. So we just talked about the uh, growing income in inequality. So there are a lot of uh, debate on whether you know school serve as a, like a transmitter of the uh, the inequality or like a serve as a great equalizer. So if there is a growing income and the school translated it and then we see the growing educational uh, inequality. However, if the school serves as a great equalizer, we see the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the decreasing the educational inequality. Of course, there is uh, some child, uh, policy change in education as well. So I'm gonna get to this end, end of the uh, presentation when I discuss the result. So uh, both in South Korea and the United States, well, there is a, a substantive uh, the level of the income in inequality, but from a comparative perspective, uh, the level of income in inequality in the United States is much higher than in the South Korea. Uh, when we talked about the trend in income in inequality as a previous uh, presenter already talked about, so uh, here in the United States, uh, the share of the uh, held by the middle income household uh, decrease over time. And when it comes to South Korea, trend is uh, quite interesting. So they left the figure indicating uh, the trend in the Gini coefficient. So since, I mean, 1990s, the, the Gini coefficient to increase, especially in uh, 1997, when uh, there is economic crisis. And then after 2009 and 2010, actually Gini coefficients decline over time. So it's the increase and then the decrease. And then what is really interesting is that if you compare the ratio between the, uh, the, uh, the 90 percentile and 50 percentile versus the 50 percentile and 10 percentile. So basically this, uh, the round dot indicating uh, the, the trend of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, P50, uh, percentile and the P10 percentile. So basically this, uh, the gap actually increased over time, but the, the, the gap between the middle income and high income actually kind of a, the remain the steady over time. And when we talked about the uh, inequality in educational attainment, so uh, this graph is indicating the degree of the intergenerational mobility in education. So this proportion indicating the young adults uh, obtain higher level of education attainment uh, compared to their parents. So here the, uh, the blue, uh, so this is the size of a blue 
bar is the largest in Korea, indicating the, the many of the Korean young adults actually achieved a higher level of education than uh, their parents. Um, the United States, this blue bar is a relatively small, actually is below the average. So we can say that, well, there is an inequality in education attainment, but the degree is a much smaller in the Korea and the United States from the comparative perspective. Why? Well, actually, that's because of the South Korea experience, a great level of education expense, uh, expense, uh, expansion over the uh, half a century. So this graph shows that the uh, gross enrollment ratio in the tertiary education. So uh, 1970s, so about the 10% of the high school graduate actually uh, went to the uh, college. Uh, that time, uh, more than like 40% of a high school uh, graduate in the United States went to the college. But this ratio dramatically increased during the 1990s. And then since around the uh, 2000, actually this rate in Korea actually surpassed uh, the United States. So, so South Korea is now the, one of the countries shows the, the highest level of the college in Norman. So because of the digital education expansion, this is a, like a, a demographic uh, composition change by the, uh, the highest level of education. So here the left side by 2050, about 25% of the adult population uh, have a post-secondary secondary education. However, by 2050, almost half of the uh, adult population uh, have um, the uh, post-secondary education. So this graph, it shows the uh, contrasting uh, the prediction between the South Korea and the United States. However, uh, that doesn't necessarily means that the, there is a, uh, like, you know, uh, the inequality is not, does not exist in South Korean in, uh, context. And actually we can look at this some like a horizontal or like a qualitative inequality. In other words, still United States in South Korea in both country, high income uh, children, they are more likely enrolled in uh, private selective college. That is also the case in the South Korea. So there's a, like a horizontal uh, inequality in education attainment. In another dimension of the educational inequality is that the social economic achievement gap so here, the United States, um, the uh, the Sean Riordan in Stanford University, they're looking at the trend uh, in academic achievement between the 90 versus the 10 percentile the income, and then he found that you know the income gap actually increased over time. However, the recently the Hanosek and his colleague replicated the Riordan's uh, the the study and reached a very different conclusion. So basically they found that the actually the uh, uh, 10 versus, I mean, 90 versus the 10 income achievement gap actually does not change much over the uh, past uh, decades. He criticized the Hanusek and their colleague, uh, his colleague criticized the Riordan study because you know the uh, uh, empirically uh, there is a lot of uh, measurement error in the income. So the Hanozek and his colleague like you know impute the missing value on the income and replicate it, and they reached a very uh, different conclusion. In addition, the Hanozek actually also look at the international uh, large scale data called uh, Teams in PISA. And they look at the you know bottom twenty five percent and then top twenty five percent, and they they, they found uh, the gap actually uh, does not change either. But when it comes to PISA data, actually they they found that like you know the the decreasing the uh, uh, SES uh, gap in achievement at least seventy five percent and twenty five percent. Um, in South Korea, uh, I look at the uh, the um, uh, the trend in the socioeconomic achievement gap. And I look at it basically in 1999 and through the 2007, so the, I used uh, TIMS data, and I found that the uh, uh, small increase in the inequality in terms of the academic achievement in Korea. And I also look at the PISA data, also the uh, achievement gap by social economic status actually increased over time in Korea. However, this is all, I mean, okay, so, so what, International uh, study uh, suggests that in the South Korea, actually the inequality or equity actually become worse in the recent year, 
So these graphs indicating this at the bottom, the uh, X as indicating the percent of the variance explained by uh, students' socioeconomic status. So close to the zero, they uh, indicating greater equality. If the, the number is increasing, that the uh, greater inequality. So in South Korea, actually they're moving this direction, so greater inequality. Whereas the United States actually there's a huge uh, progress toward a more equal uh, education outcome. So that's what we know. However, in a prior study, just to focus on achievement gap by you know paying attention to the children from the poor uh, or the rich, and little attention has paid to the children from the middle class uh, family. So in this study, I'm more focused on the children uh, from the middle class family. So data, I look at the TIMS and PISA data. This is a two international uh, large scale survey that allowed me to compare not only within the country, but the, across the country, like between the United States and in South Korea. So PISA, I mean, to start with the uh, TIMS, TIMS uh, conducted in every four years since 1995. And they focus on the first and eighth grade. So it's a grade level uh, uh, based uh, uh, population. Uh, they use a two stages stratified sample. So basically they randomly uh, sample a nationally representative of the school. And then the student within that school is a sample. And they uh, evaluate the math and science. Whereas PISA uh, conducted every three years since 2003, uh, this is a more age-based population. So they focus on 15 years old. Uh, they uh, use also uh, uh, two stratified two stages stratified sample, and they measure the reading and math and science. So um, a team's first grade and eighth grades corresponding the primary level and lower secondary level. Uh, while the PISA data corresponding upper secondary. So in this study, we've, I focus on the lower secondary and upper uh, secondary because not uh, uh, Korea uh, did not participate in some of the uh, first grade team survey. So I look at the uh, all outcome, like reading, math, and science, but in, in this presentation, I just present uh, the result for the reading. Um, uh, for PISA and the eighth grade, I'm looking at the uh, mass. So this is the sample size. So when it comes to measure of SDS, so in teams include a couple of measures that can we utilize to measure uh, the, the socioeconomic status, including parental education, number of books, and home possession. Um, a PISA have a more a better measure of the uh, socioeconomic status, including parental occupation. Uh, both study uh, survey do not include uh, the income information. That's one of the limitation, but Hanosek demonstrate uh, the, this uh, indicator, parental education, uh, home possession is a better measure of the SDS because you know many students are uh, not sure about the, their you know, parental their income. Uh, so I standardize it, uh, so mean equal to zero and standard deviation is one and academic achievement. So basically teams measure more traditional mastery of the uh, school curriculum, whereas PISA measure more application of the, uh, the, the knowledge that learn the student into the real life. And both achievement scale, the mean equal to 500 and standard deviation 100. So how do I define the social, I mean, the middle class as a uh, uh, professor uh, Kwang Yan Shin mentioned, there are a lot of a different definition, but in this study, I follow the Brook Brookings definition of the middle class. So basically I define children as a middle 60% and lower middle, uh, bottom 20%, upper middle, top 20%. And I also use a different uh, definition of the social class. So basically I use, uh, based on the literature on the income inequality, I define the children uh, 50 percentile and 10 percentile and 90 percentile. So starting with the lower secondary, so basically this is the uh, the middle school. So left side indicating, uh, showing the uh, the result for the United States. As you can see here, so the level of the overall achievement in math achievement actually slightly increased over time. That's also the case in United, I mean the, in South Korea. 
So overall achievement among the uh, children from the middle class family increase over time. I want to highlight that this scale is a difference. So here the United States, the scale about the 480, whereas Korea about, uh, about the 600. So there is a huge gap in academic achievement between the children from the middle class family in Korea and the children from the similar background showing the much higher level of uh, educational excellence in Korea compared to the uh, United States. Oh, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Now I compare with the lower and the upper. So as you can see here, the United States, regardless of the social class, the, the overall level of achievement increase over time. That's the, also the uh, case in, the, in South Korea. But as you can see here, the gap between the uh, lower uh, middle class and, and middle class actually uh, relatively large. Uh, trend is quite similar if you look at the top bottom uh, 10 percent, uh, upper 90 percent and the middle 50 percent. So there's overall uh, the very similar trend. When it comes to upper uh, level, uh, upper secondary, so basically high school, the trend is very different. Here's the United States, the overall achievement of the middle class uh, children doesn't change that much over time. Uh, in Korea, actually slightly increased and then it's declined over time since 19, uh, 2009. So this is a comparison of the uh, lower and upper. So here in United States, if you look at the gap between the, the upper and the lower, this is the largest. And then this gap actually decreased over time and in here in recent cohort. In South Korea, it's quite opposite. So this is the gap is the upper and the lower is the smallest. And then it increased over time in here. Well, regardless of the social class, overall achievement actually declined over time. The trend, overall trend is very similar. If you look at the uh, bottom 10%, middle 50% and uh, upper 90%. So when you look at the lower secondary education level, academic achievement of middle class children tend to have a increase from the 1995 and 2019 in both the United States and in South Korea. However, in upper level secondary, academic achievement of the middle class children have not changed much from the 2000 2018 in the United States, whereas it tend to be declined in the South Korea. This result, especially for the upper secondary level, suggests that the intergenerational mobility, especially among the children, middle class children, may not improve in the next few years in the United States, whereas it may even worsen in the Korea. Another important finding is that decline trend in academic achievement is most evident for children from the lower middle class family in Korea, resulting in the widening socioeconomic achievement gap. By contrast, there is an increasing trend in academic achievement, especially for children from the lower middle class family in the, uh, the United States, resulting in the narrowing social economic achievement. So this differs in uh, the trend in social economic achievement gap uh, between the South Korea and, and the, uh, the United States are not constant with a trend is the income inequality, but the constant with the prior work using PISA data. So the question is that how can we explain, how can we understand this difference in um, the, um, the trend? And I wanna conclude by highlighting importance of educational policy. So it traditionally, the education system here in the United States uh, marked by the high degree of decentralization and local control and multiple uh, grassroots reform highlighting, you know, expanding school choice and highly individualized and differentiated in the curriculum. Whereas in South Korea, marked by the high degree of centralization, state control, and standardization. However, in the United States, recent education reform more focusing on the reducing between school inequality and uh, social economic achievement gap by more uh, providing more resources at the lower achieving and the lower SS children. So NCLB, rest top in the common core, that's a key educational policy. However, in South Korea, actually try to follow the American, traditional American model uh, to reform the education system, especially upper level, uh, uh, upper uh, secondary level, uh, by introducing the new types of the high school, uh, practicing the ability grouping, and, and so on forth. So different, the taking different approach to the education uh, quite likely uh, shape differently 
the education inequality in terms of the, uh, the academic achievement in both countries. So that's my, my main argument. So I, st I stopped here. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker of this session is Mianji Yang. She is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Um, and um, she got her PhD from Brown University uh, and uh, has broad research interests, including political sociology, sociology of development, inequality, social movements, and East Asia. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you for a nice introduction, uh, Professor Kalleberg. And I uh, especially thank you for um, Professor Wang Yongxin and KDA Step for having me here. Uh, and thank you all for staying uh, until the very last presentation today. So uh, in my previous work, uh, I, I worked on a uh, historical trajectory of the Korean middle class, and I was particularly interested in how class mobility took place with uh, speculative urban development and how ordinary citizens climbed the economic ladder through their individual strategies in a housing market. So in today's presentation, I want to present my uh, new research um, based on the relationship among the uh, urban space, middle or upper middle class identity and their political attitudes focusing on how Gangnam area became a conservative stronghold. So uh, a lot of uh, studies on social classes focus on incomes, occupation and education, uh, but a lot of uh, urban scholars uh, increasingly pay attention to the relationship between urban space and class uh, inequality and identity. So um, existing scholarship has documented that class differentiation and segregation manifest in urban space and the production of space and class identity goes hand in hand. In hand. And many studies have demonstrated how different class, uh, how different lifestyles and class identity fashioned in particular neighborhoods, as you can commonly see, in, uh, commonly see in, in many global cities. And um, another set of literature in political science also uh, focus on the relationship between home ownership and voting behaviors. So for example, political scientist uh, Ansel argues that homeowners who experience housing price appreciation will become less supportive of redistribution and uh, social insurance programs since higher housing prices mean more valuable private insurance. So um, homeowners, um, particularly homeowners with high property values are more likely to vote in a more conservative way. So recent studies uh, on the rise of the right in the United States um, provides explanation on uh, why people in particular places or regions share conservative political orientations. So inspired by uh, Ali uh, Hochschild and uh, Catherine Kramers, I'm, in my presentation, I'm trying to demonstrate the relationship between place and middle class identity and conservatism in South Korea. So uh, when we talk about middle or upper middle class, especially in South Korea, Gangnam is always brought up as a representative and symbol uh, of the Korean middle class. So Gangnam refers to the three administrative units, uh, including Gangnam, Seocho, Songpa, as you can see uh, in the map. Uh, and this is the most common definition used in uh, South Korea. And uh, um, this particular area symbolizes uh, the most affluent and expensive area in uh, Seoul and uh, South Korea. So um, Gangnam was the first site in Korea targeted by planned urban development projects and developed into a middle-class residential district. So Gangnam has become what is now as a symbol of middle-class status culture and social aspiration for class upward mobility. So it's the center of finance, education, fashion and information technology and provides access to good school districts and convenient living environments. 
So Gangnam status as the most desirable district, residential district um, in Seoul has maintained its high housing prices and attracted many affluent middle-class families uh, for the last few decades. Um, but at the same time, Gangnam has been a stronghold for the Conservative Party since the mid-1990s, along with the Daegu Gangbuk region. So while the capital city, Seoul, is generally politically liberal and tends to give stronger support for the sort of uh, leftist liberal party, Gangnam district were always the exception. So as you can see uh, in this uh, presidential election outcomes for the last uh, 25 years, uh, Gangnam voters have uh, strongly supported the conservative candidates compared with the Seoul average and national average. So uh, the red part are like conservative candidates. And you can see that the pattern uh, uh, for conservative uh, voting become stronger over the years. And then this one is the uh, outcome of general uh, election since 1992. Again, uh, without almost no exception, the conservative candidates uh, won the election. Uh, and then obviously over the years, the tendency becomes stronger. So my research questions are, why do Gangnam uh, voters, residents strongly support the conservative party and its candidates and what shapes their political identity? So um, I argue that conservative political positions are closely tied to their identity as Gangnam residents. So I define Gangnam residents as uh, anxious materialists. So those whose voting behaviors are driven by their material class interests uh, as homeowners of high property values living in an exclusive urban space. Uh, but at the same time, they are uh, anxious and angry about the real estate market regulation implemented by the so-called so leftist reformist government. So this is a part of my larger project on the right-wing politics in South Korea. And over the last few years, uh, I have conducted observation and in-depth interviews and archival research. And my uh, uh, research outcome today will uh, draw from those uh, data that I collected. Um, so first, I should talk about how particular middle-class identity was formed in Gangnam area. So when Gangnam was developed beginning in the 1970s, high-rise apartment complexes as a typical middle-class residence were massively built and concentrated uh, there. Uh, Gangnam became a place containing homogeneous middle-class families, generally uh, families of white-collar workers, corporate managers, and professionals um, who could afford to buy a new and modern apartment unit back then. Uh, further, Gangnam was a site of real estate boom and many residents there benefited from escalating housing prices. So by selling and um, buying apartments unit, uh, apartment units for a few times, they could climb the housing ladder and became homeowners of high property values. So as Gangnam becomes an aspiration, aspirational place where everybody wants to move, Gangnam residents share a sense of pride and spirituality that living in Gangnam is better than the rest of the city and rest of the country. So many Gangnam residents display a very exclusive class identity by making distinctions between Gangnam and the rest of uh, the area. So rest of the city or rest of uh, the nation. So for example, a lot of Gangnam residents talk about, you know, living in Gangnam um, is much better. So like, you know, in, in their neighborhoods or area, the, the members of um, people uh, are more educated, cultured, and they are more um, um, sophisticated. And then they describe their areas as, you know, wide, clean, less chaotic. Um, so you can see very clear disting uh, distinctions that they make about their own places and others. Um, so the reason that Gangnam could become an exclusive space is that it has high property values and not everybody could afford to live there. 
So when Gangnam's property values decline and most people can afford to live, its distinctive values will disappear, obviously. Uh, during the so-called leftist government, uh, especially uh, during the Noh Myon and Moon Jae-in governments, um, they try to address speculative real estate market and stabilize housing prices. So the leftist governments were uh, also targeted Gangnam area as the area where severe speculation took place and higher property taxes should be imposed on owners of multiple homes with extremely high property values. However, these reform actions had strong criticisms and backlashes from the conservative party, conservative media, and Gangnam residents and homeowners. So let me introduce uh, some quotes from uh, the conservative media about how they describe the new comprehensive real estate taxes. So as you can see, they describe um, those uh, homeowners uh, who were hit by this new scheme of uh, new tax scheme um, as innocent victims. So they didn't speculate. They are just you know homeowners. They don't make a lot of money, but they were. Uh, hard hit by this uh, reformist action and they cannot afford to pay tax. So basically, you know, they accuse the uh, reformist government of kind of targeting innocent homeowners and making them pay excessive taxes. And uh, most Gangnam homeowners commonly uh, share this content, strong discontent about the uh, leftist government act. So they commonly said that the leftist governments criminalize or demonize the Gangnam homeowners. Further, uh, many believed that the so-called leftist governments punish the rich and disincentivize hard work and individual marriage. So for them, uh, living in Gangnam and living in properties with high values was considered a result of hard work and um, good investment skill. So they believed that what the leftist government do was um, create sort of distort, um, dis distortive and artificial equality, which is very similar to what socialist country does. And another common sentiment among Gangnam homeowners was that, you know, the homes that they own are their private properties. And then government should not violate private property rights and their private freedoms, uh, individual uh, freedoms. So they had very strong uh, anger, resentment toward this new tax scheme. Um, and because of their strong belief in meritocracy and elitism, they cannot agree with the uh, reformist agendas on redistribution or social welfare. They view that the reformist party and its politicians try to destroy the established order represented by Gangnam uh, residents and to rebuild a new order. Yet they share a deep sense of doubt and disbelief about the new world. So uh, they believe that the leftist party and government uh, not only threaten their status quo, and, but, but they, also, uh, they are also more corrupt and hypocritic. So you can see the, uh, the second paragraph, uh, the new establishment, which consists of former um, uh, student activists and progressive intellectuals, uh, they are not confident at all, uh, and then they even more corrupt and hypocritic. So um, uh, while Gangnam residents' strong opposition against the reformist party can be seen as a rational calculation of Gangnam residents, a decision that the reformist party does not represent their political identity and class interests, there exists an emotional dimension here, a deep sense of hate and contempt toward the working class and its representative. Um, the working class um, uh, 
has often been uh, considered poor, uneducated, unsophisticated, and easily agitated, which are the contrasting characteristics of Gangnam's educated and cultural residents. Uh, so for example, former president Kim Dae-jung or Noh Myung were not popular among Gangnam residents, not just because of their so-called radical or leftist policy agendas, it was also because both of them were high school graduates or, and were considered not culturally refined. Especially uh, Noh Myung's speeches uh, or actions were often seen as rough and tacky. So their class background uh, was constant burger, and they did not share the Gangnam habitus in Bourdieu's terms. So as you can oh, see, okay, yeah, as you can see in this quote, um, while it is true that many Gangnam residents disagree with policies, especially uh, real estate policies adopted by the uh, leftist party and government. Um, but there is widespread feeling uh, uh, shared by Gangnam residents. The feeling of repulsion uh, does not necessarily come from specific policies, rather it's from a strong disregard toward the lower class, uh, often represented by the opposite of Gangnam, uh, which is Gangbuk, um, across the river, and the representative reformist party. Uh, as you can see, you know, um, one Gangnam resident said, um, they do not want to support the left party supported by Gangbuk uh, commoners who were coarse young people. So you can see that you know Gangnam people try to make very clear distinction between them and others. Um, so Gangnam residents believe that those who are on the opposite side of the political spectrum are culturally and economically inferior and sharing similar ideas with them um, are considered sort of uh, de deplorable. So um, in conclusion, uh, place matters to shape class identity and uh, also political identity and it affects their voting behaviors and parents. And Gangnam residents share exclusive identity as a resident as, as residents of high property values and having high uh, cultural capital, and then they share a sense of superiority compared with uh, non Gangnam residents. And uh, because uh, they believe that uh, the leftist party uh, doesn't represent their material class and in, uh, uh, cl class interest. They try to vote against the uh, uh, leftist party and then vote for like conservative party that will ensure their uh, high property values and deregulate uh, uh, taxes and uh, real estate market uh, policies. So this is it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I think we should give them a hand. Um, well, we have um, a number of questions uh, already in the chat, uh, and um, maybe we could just start in. Um, so the first question is how middle how middle class shrinking could affect the legitimacy of democratic governments. Um, does anybody want to try that? Well, so can I just throw in, but isn't the conclusion from several of the papers here that there's not much middle class shrinking? Okay. <laughs> How about stagnation? Fair question. Um, so maybe I'll... I'll I'll try to say something about my understanding of the American context and how it maybe differs from what seems like is going on in Korea, at least judging by the, the fourth presentation here. So in, in the United States, like it in at least some other rich democratic nations, there's been a switching of the, if you wanna call it the class or strata basis of the, the left and right political parties. So whereas, the working class and to some degree the poor and 
lower parts of the middle class tended to support the left in the decades after World War II, mainly on economic grounds because they thought the left was better for their material well-being and the right you know, was in favor of lower taxes and what they thought would, would be stronger economic growth. Um, this is now flipped to a significant degree, at least when you think by education, it's a little less clear in terms of income, but by education um, there, in the United States and, and some other countries, there's been a complete transformation. And so college graduates tend to vote very heavily for the left party and, and those without a college degree are more likely to vote for right parties who in turn are more likely to be the populist parties, although that, that doesn't always work perfectly. And so it's not at all clear to me what, what changes in the middle class mean uh, in, in this regard or the, or the implications that they have for uh, democratic stability. So it's, it, it tends to be so-called populist parties of the right that are uh, in countries like the United States, Hungary, Poland, Turkey, uh, that Brazil now that, that are the biggest threats to the stability of democracy, they're now um, more likely to be backed by, by voters with less education, whether they're middle class or not, I, 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 I don't know. I guess I wanna throw in an, an additional complication that struck me from this last presentation. So if I think about the, the counterpart in the United States. I, I think about affluent parts of big cities, whether Manhattan or San Francisco or Los Angeles. Maybe there are particular districts that behave like uh, the voters in Gangnam seem to be doing, but I think that they'd be much more likely to, to vote for the Democratic Party in the United States, be more likely to be highly educated. They're voting against their presumed class interests and it's mainly because of their their views on social and cultural issues. They're just committed to they're, they're much more affiliated with with a liberal progressive view on on social and cultural issues, and they vote based on those issues now rather than based on their again you know sort of presumed economic interests and lower taxes. But the housing question may throw a wrench in this, uh, and and in the following way. So as we kind of talked about before, housing has gotten very expensive in the United States, but it's mostly in the, the big cities. And those cities are overwhelmingly liberal, even among college educated rich voters. So now uh, policymakers are trying to figure out what to do. And it, it looks like, and there's a kind of emerging consensus that the biggest obstacle to solving the housing problem in the United States is, um, uh, is restrictions on building. It's just blockages of the housing supply. And so so-called NIMBYs, not in my backyard, uh, mostly homeowners who uh, are in favor of building lots more housing all over the country, except very close to where they live. They're the ones that are blocking loosening of the regulations and therefore construction of more housing. The Democratic Party, I mean, it, it could have been either party that had decided that would decide we're in favor of loosening these regulations and allowing more housing construction. But it looks like the Democrats are, are the ones that are uh, at least changing their views um, most immediately. It's, it's partly because they're the ones that preside over, they're, they're the ones in charge of most of these big cities and the states in which many of these cities are located, like California, New York, Massachusetts. Um, so, you know, our, our American voters in Gangnam type districts are going to stick with the Democratic Party if the Democratic Party insists on loosening regulations to allow a lot more affordable housing to be built in these districts. I don't know. I, I think it's too soon to tell, but that's a that's a real possibility. I think if they did, it would be for other reasons than what you suggested here. But but anyway, I, I, I just think this is an interesting, fascinating possibility. Uh, I'll stop because I've already talked too long. Mianji, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so, uh, I think uh, that's very uh, interesting and sharp comments. I, I was also thinking that like uh, compared with Western counterpart, Gangnam uh, voters are very unique because uh, if you think about you know American uh, upper middle class that have uh, uh, 
high incomes, usually they vote for um, liberal uh, democratic party. Uh, I, I think it goes same in you know, European countries as well. I think uh, in the Korean case, there is a special meaning attached to housing as uh, you know, investment. So uh, those who live in Gangnam or in any other areas in Seoul, um, having a home uh, whose uh, prices are escalating is very important to many homeowners because uh, that's the only asset or wealth they, they own. So, you know, their future economic uh, prospect is very tied to whether housing prices increase or not. So I think, you know, uh, for, for Korean people, how housing has very special meaning beyond, you know, some living place. And if I give example uh, about what happened last few years during the Moon Jae-in government, uh, I recently looked up the average uh, apartment price in Seoul. Uh, I think it's uh, the average apartment price in Seoul is $1 million. So if you think about you know, average housing prices somewhere else in the United States, even for an uh, expensive city, this is just, uh, I don't know, like eye-opening, uh, very surprising. So, and then a lot of people try to play game in the housing market. So like they don't have a lot of income uh, other than their salaries. And if you, uh, if, if they uh, had really good investment skill and then their housing prices um, escalated quickly, they can sell and they can buy a bigger one or they can make a lot of money. So, you know, housing is sort of means of gambling in the in Korean society. So that uh, I think that's partly why, you know, these people behave uh, in a very conservative way and they don't want to pay higher prop property taxes because uh, housing is the only economic means that they have, uh, especially for uh, elderly population. So I, I'm not sure if my answer, uh, if, if my comments answers your question, uh, but. Uh Kwang Young, you want to take this question, that the second question, I would like to hear opinions regarding uh, the aspects of the labor and real estate policies of both the former and current Korean governments from the perspective of income inequality. I think you're muted, though. The rise of housing price uh, is associated with the, uh, some kind of uh, uh, supply of uh, money due to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, policy. So uh, government in uh, almost all countries uh, provided uh, uh, lots of uh, money uh, to uh, uh, promote some economy and to uh, prevent some spread of uh, coronavirus. So a, a kind of a over a supply of money uh, became a, a real source for some uh, rising uh, housing uh, price in, in so in other countries. So uh, almost all uh, European countries uh, has have experienced that kind of uh, some uh, speculative uh, some um, purchase of apartment houses by a resident. Uh, in Korea, uh, especially, uh, it took place uh, in uh, Seoul and uh, Seoul metropolitan area. So it's uh, much more uh, concentrated and much more uh, intense. So it became a, a hot issue uh, during the uh, election. And now it, is, it seems like uh, uh, some uh, uh, real estate uh, bubble uh, bust. So sudden, uh, decli suddenly uh, declining housing prices became a serious uh, issue right now after uh, three or four or months uh, of uh, the presidential election. So it's 
it's quite different uh, situation right now uh, compared to the uh, housing price in last year. So it's, it's very it's, it's volatile, uh, some uh, fluctuation of housing prices became a, another uh, problem. As I mentioned uh, before, so housing uh, became an uh, important uh, uh, investment for uh, middle class in South Korea. And the price uh, is, is going down and the, the price of uh, the housing and the real estate became a, a very, a, a very low value, uh, valued. Then the uh, many uh, middle class cannot pay back to the bank. So it became a, a serious uh, source of financial crisis. So now uh, it is a, a very a different uh, social change and economic change after the very uh, uh, high rocketing uh, housing uh, price in the for the past two or three years. Suddenly, uh, it, the housing prices is is rapidly uh, falling down. So it is another uh, problem for the um, Korean middle class, especially Thank in you. Seoul and uh, metropolitan area. Super. Thank you. Uh, let, let me throw this to Professor Byung. Um, uh, doesn't the fact that education used to be the only way to class mobility in the 20th century Korea, but not anymore, affect the slight dip in the secondary tertiary education rate in the country? With the rise of uh, SNS and YouTube, people see more and more success stories that are seemingly irrelevant to regular education. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. And actually, you know, many people, many people believe so, you know, uh, however, we don't have any empirical evidence that the importance of the education in determining the income or like, you know, occupational attainment decreases over time. As a matter of fact, uh, recently, uh, Changwan came in the uh, Kansas University. Uh, he published a book showing that actually education premium does not change over time. So again, like in you know, education is still important uh, to determine the income and the occupational status. Like, you know, Delane uh, talked about the, you know, increasing importance of the education here in the United States. Well, obviously, you know, uh, with the rise of the SNN YouTube, well, we can see, we can hear. Uh, well, actually, you know, we can easily hear uh, about the you know, successful study. I mean, because it's really easy to like, you know, the assessment and like uh, 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 spread. Um, but there are only few, right? We, I'm, we, I'm talking about in like average, like, you know, population and, and the, at the national level, there are only few successful study. However, on the average, um, you know, uh, a lot of educated people are more successful story. I mean, this is like, you know, very similar story about like in you know, a Bill Gates, Bill Gates is like a college dropout. So many people that in a college is not needed anymore. Well, that's not true, right? There are more CEO of a company who graduate and complete in, in, in a college. Thank you. Uh, Lane, you got another question here, but let me, can I just throw a question in here about to you about this? I, in terms of your likely scenarios, the tight labor markets, the minimum wages, the profit sharing and so on, how is that going? How do you see that coming to pass unless there is increased worker power? Um, is it going to happen politically, do you think, or uh, or? or what, what, what do you see as the mechanism? Well, it's, it's not that I'm super optimistic about this, but I do, I, I am actually more optimistic than I was 10 years ago about tight labor markets as a possibility. So I used to think, well, okay, the, the Federal Reserve, our, our central bank here in the US, did keep interest rates low from 96 to 2000, and that did help drive wages up, really, at that point, for the only, the, the only moment. Uh, since 1980, but I thought it's really unlikely to do it again. It was a function of 
Alan Greenspan's idiosyncrasies and his, his views. But then it did it again under a Trump appointed uh, head of the Federal Reserve from 2016 to, to 2019. I mean, it started under Janet Yellen, but, um, but Jerome Powell continued it. Um, and so that makes me more optimistic. You know, again, with inflation going up now, I don't know, it could be that central bankers in the United States and elsewhere are going to be spooked for another 40 years and go back to focusing purely on keeping inflation low. But anyway, I'm a little more optimistic there. Uh, profit sharing, I don't think requires uh, strong labor unions. Um, um, the occupation and sector specific minimum wage probably does, although there is some possibility that you could see it emerge at the state level, like in California, New York, Massachusetts, Washington, Oregon. And if it works, uh, you know, there's some possibility it might spread or uh, an administration at some point at the federal level might decide, yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and adopt this. And I think the earned income tax credit is entirely plausible. I mean, that that has happened and it's, it's been expanded relatively uh, steadily over the last 45 years, I guess it was created in 1975, um, while unions were weak and weakening in the United States. So I, I don't see any strong obstacle there. I, I completely believe that all of this stuff and more would be a lot easier to do with strong unions, but I don't think it's necessarily impossible without strong unions. Great. Uh, Professor Yang, you've got a couple of questions here about Gangnam. Uh, you can you see them in the chat. Uh, perhaps you could just address them in the few minutes we have left, please. Okay. Uh, uh, do I think behavior of Gangnam is something to be improved or rectified? Um, I think the if the value of Gangnam or privilege of Gangnam changes, maybe their behavior will uh, change. But as long as Gangnam premium maintains, I don't think their political positions or attitude will change. Um, but as Professor um, Shin said, uh, there, is, there seems slight changes in uh, slight changes in housing prices at this point, but I'm not sure how long it will last. And even if housing prices overall declines, I don't think it is significantly affect the Gangnam area because people uh, want to live there. So, you know, as long as there is high demand, I don't think the value of Gangnam will decline. So um, I think in the short term, I don't, I don't see any changes, uh, but maybe in the long term, um, obviously the, the biggest problem with, uh, with Korea is that um, so many things are concentrated in Seoul metropolitan area. But with the you know um, population decrease, and uh, if the government maybe promotes decentralization, maybe the picture would be different. But I don't see any kind of policy change at this point, so uh, I I don't have optimistic uh, uh, view about this. And uh, Gangnam Japa, Gangnam leftist. But as I showed, uh, you can see the overwhelming majority of uh, conservative attitude in Gangnam. So Gangnam Japa is sort of a, um, uh, the term that conservative media try to uh, criticize their Hippocratic behavior, but I, I'm not sure uh, how uh, significant or how uh, meaningful to talk about uh, Gangnam leftists. Uh, are. Um, so I think that would be my uh, brief answer to the questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we're just about out of time. Uh, and I want to thank the presenters for, for their great presentations. And, uh, um, and I, uh, I guess this ends this, this second session. And the next session will be tomorrow. Um, tomorrow morning in Seoul and in the evening over here in the States and wherever. So um, thank you very much and... Um... Thank you, Arnie. This marks the end of day one of the seminar. I would like to thank you all for your early morning or late evening participation. And I hope today's seminar was uh, as valuable for you as it was for me. You're now free to leave and I'm looking forward to seeing you again at tomorrow's session. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the day two of the Korea-U.S. Policy Dialogue. I'm Hee Sun Kim from KDI School. Continuing from yesterday, I'll serve as an MC of the event today. In case you missed the day one, the 2022 Policy Dialogue hosted by the KDI School shares the results of the Korea-U.S. collaborative research on economic inequality and the future of the middle class. This event is being broadcast live on KDI School's YouTube channel. Thank you again, participants around the globe, for your interest and participation. Now let us begin today's session, the last session of the event, on perception of the turbulent world of the middle class. If you have any questions during the presentation, please leave them on the YouTube chat, and we will address your questions during the Q&A session. Please allow me to introduce the chair for our third session, Professor Lane Kenworthy. Lane Kenworthy is Professor of Sociology and Jan Kalovich Chair in Social Thought at the UC San Diego. His research interests primarily focus on living standards, poverty, inequality, economic growth, and social policy. Please welcome Professor Kenworthy. Okay, hi, uh, welcome back everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, we're gonna start right in. I'm gonna try to keep the introductions very short. And uh, as yesterday, I'll, I'll interrupt when there are five minutes left and one minute left, uh, and then I'll, I'll moderate the questions at the end. So we've got three uh, very interesting looking presentations. The first is by Yongmi Kim, uh, from Yonsei uh, University, and I apologize if I've got pronunciations wrong, um, forgive me. Uh, she's Associate Professor of Sociology at, uh, at Yonsei, and the title of her presentation is Converging Narratives Amid Diverging Destinies in South Korea. So thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to have a chance to uh, participate in this interesting uh, and meaningful discussion on economic inequality and the future of the middle class. And to think about the future of the middle class um, is an interesting, uh, interesting job uh, as a scholar, especially inequality scholar. And today I would like to talk something from a, a little bit different angle, you know, the angle of demography. I'm going to talk about how uh, the economic inequality uh, linked with the individual fertility desires and intentions. So the title of my today's presentation is Converging Narratives Amid Diverging Destinies in Korea, uh, Narratives of Fertility and Their Variation Across Class and Gender. Okay, so this presentation is organized into three parts. First, I'm going to present what is called uh, a novel trend of fertility, uh, which is the weakening of the differential fertility in the context of rising inequality. Uh, and we'll discuss how this trend challenges previous influential discussion in the field of demography in U.S., known as the uh, diverging destinies hypothesis, as well as some of the famous qualitative studies uh, analyzing low SES women's fertility decision. Uh, then I'll present my own research analyzing narratives of fertility among Korean young adults. And last, I'll discuss policy implications of the finding. Okay, so this graph shows the fertility trend in OECD countries. Obviously, Korea stands out as the lowest fertility country, but not only in OECD, but in the whole wide world. So Korea broke the world uh, TFR record and reached to the uh, TFR uh, 0.81 uh, in 2021. We are not alone in this trend though. Recently, TFR dropped in most of high income countries since the Great Depression of 2008, including Nordic countries, uh, which have been the icon of fertility rebound in the late 20th century. The famous gender egalitarianism approach to fertility owed greatly to the empirics created by Nordic countries. So it is a bit of a surprise that Nordic countries joined the trend of recent fertility drop. A lot of demographic decomposition analysis shows that the drop is not a matter of a postponement of fertility that is called the tempo effect, but a matter of a decline in fertility size in and of itself that is the quantum effect. So in Korea, um, 
uh, we are uh, seeing the same kind of trend. Um, right, so uh, now women these days give birth, not just later, but fewer. And some scholars call this as a novel trend of fertility. And recent studies uh, shows that uh, uh, in Korea, it is also driven by the quantum effect. In Korea, marital fertility rate is important because marriage and childbearing is still strongly connected in Korea and non-marital fertility is really low. And the marital fertility had been maintained relatively high. So the low TFR used to be considered um, uh, to be caused by the declining marriage rate uh, but not by the declining marital fertility. But this has changed and the marital fertility started to decline since 2015. But what I want to emphasize today is a slightly less highlighted pattern, which is the weakening of the differential fertility. Differential fertility means the difference in the number of births across socioeconomic class. I will use the term class very casually and exchangeably with income group or education group in this presentation. The relationship between family income and the number of children used to be negative in the past. However, it is reported to be weakening in almost all Western countries and Korea as well. There are a few research that reported this another novel trend in Korea. According to them, the fertility rate has declined in all income classes. Uh, the fertility rate dropped faster among the lowest education group, and the negative income fertility relationship was flattened in recent cohorts. This novel trend poses a puzzle, particularly because it is happening in the context of rising inequality. This challenges the previous demographic theories, uh, uh, the, the diverging destinies hypothesis. Diverging destinies is a concept that American demographer Sarah McLanahan proposed in her 2004 presidential address to the Population Association of America. McLanahan argued that in the US and other Western countries, the second demographic transition was leading to two very different trajectories for women with very different implications for children. So children who are born to the most educated women are gaining resources in terms of parents' time and money, but those who were born to the least educated women are losing resources. There, the negative relationship between education and fertility was considered as a key demographic pattern that produced such gaps in parental resources and um, mobility intergenerational mobility. It has been argued that um, as inequality increases, the class difference in demographic behaviors might become strengthened as well because uh, for one, higher wage differentials across education groups will increase highly educated women's opportunity cost of childbirth, uh, thereby negatively affecting their fertility decision toward greater degree. Um, and from a slightly different angle, uh, some scholars have argued that the increasing inequality will strengthen the class difference in parenting, and the so-called quantity quality trade-off will become stronger in upper and middle class, uh, negatively affecting their fertility decision to a greater degree. So, uh, uh, and a European economist, Ed Serra, has discussed four drivers that can mediate inequality and childbearing decisions, uh, behaviors of women of different educational background. And uh, two of these drivers are related with labor market changes. She discussed that the fertility um, is likely to be procyclical and the rising employment polarization will exacerbate the financial situation of working class families to a greater degree to negatively affect their fertility. As for the persistent impact of persistent gender gap in employment and wages, she discussed how women's incentives for baby will change depending on whether they are at high wage sectors or low wage sector. It's an interesting discussion and we need uh, more of this kind of discussion for sure. But think about when, you, when we think about you know, um, our research, theoretically, uh, they are not only, uh, uh, we, we, can, we can find abundant candidate hypothesis to make a macro to macro link to make sense of the puzzle. 
But the question is whether such demographic behaviors actually emerge from conscious individual level strategies. This hasn't been discussed much. So I started uh, this research from these two motivations. Uh, one is to find out the link between inequality and fertility, and the other is to find out the link between macro-level changes and micro-level individual fertility decision-making. I am taking a more uh, uh, cultural approach that emphasizes the importance of ideational factors like narratives, values, norms, individual-level strategies in fertility decisions. The research question is pretty straightforward and simple. Do the narratives of fertility among Korean young adults vary by class or gender? And for that, I use uh, 2018 Korean General Social Survey linked in-depth interview data. It's a sort of data-linked nasty study uh, sampling respondents for semi-structured interviews from a nationally representative survey. There are some interesting methodological issues, but I'll skip them and present the key findings. So the four most important finding is that there is a dominant narrative widely shared uh, regardless of gender and class. It takes a form like, if you can take responsibility, better not to give up, uh, give up birth. Uh, in Korean, 책임질 수 없으면 낳지 마라. This narrative shows some variation across class and gender, but mostly it emphasizes that it is parental responsibility to provide good environment, uh, especially good education to children for their success. As such, setting a very high standard for fertility is commonly observed across all socioeconomic groups. And this challenges previous cultural interpretation on low SES women's uh, non-marital childbearing in US. In, uh, Edin and Kepala's famous study, the dominant narrative, uh, premises I think here, is built around meaning and purposes, not financial well-being. So in US, low SES women tend to set high economic bar for marriage, but not for fertility, which is strikingly different from what this research found in Korea. And there is a slight difference in terms of elements and emphasis. I'll show uh, some of the representative interview excerpt. Um, here's a middle-class man's narrative. I'll read uh, uh, a little. A good father is a rich father. Now I live in Seoul. All the apartments are expensive, but the important thing is to be in the good hakun, good school district. You have to send your kids to a good school to get good education and to get, meet good friends. If your children grow up that way, they will have more chances to succeed in the future. But for that, you need lots of money. And there is an interesting quote too, another, uh, showing some of you know status competition. Uh, kids these days are clever, like bullying other kids living in Chugong, uh, public housing apartment. You know, so you have to make sure your kids don't feel cheap. Um, uh, this, uh, is, uh, is, this is from a man in uh, his 30s uh, working in a, a Korea conglomerate. And this is middle-class uh, woman's uh, narrative. Um, it is uh, similar, uh, building a high, in terms of building a high fertility bar. Um, uh, she says, uh, you have to take responsibility for giving uh, birth to a baby. You have to provide what they want, whether it's school or something like a studying abroad. If you can't provide it like, if I can't provide it like that, I think it's better not to have one. If I have a child, I want to raise the child without a shortage. And, and here is very interesting twist. If I happen to quit my job uh, because of the uh, childbearing, uh, we become a single income family and we'll be financially tight. Uh, and that's not good. I think deprivation will have a bad effect on the child. So here, interesting difference uh, emerges. Um, uh, is that the, 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 the thing is that middle-class woman's narrative almost always carries a narrative of career dilemma. Uh, working class, here's a working class man's narrative. It's somewhat different. 
they tend to take having children part of natural, unquestionable life course event. And this participant uh, mentioned his want to leave descendants. Uh, he emphasizes Hamukan uh, family. Hamukan is a word for a Korean word for happy, uh, but it's more uh, it has a traditional family uh, kind of a note. Uh, he also considers financial condition, emphasizing saving money before having babies, but also adds that what is needed is something just enough. He did not mention specific benchmark for what he meant by just enough. And this is working woman's narrative. What is uh, distinctive in this narrative is lots of hesitation, lots and lots of hesitation. In this interview, she values, she says she values education in parenting similar to middle class with a subtle difference, emphasizing uh, children's play and enjoyment rather than educational achievement. But what is clear is her reluctance to childbearing. She says, uh, I don't like it when I think about having a baby and doing back body, the dual earning uh, thing. Um, my body will be Five damaged minutes. and all. Uh, and I'll give a birth, but I don't want to. So her narrative also carries a narrative of career dilemma, but it is different from previous middle-class women's narrative. So how is it different? Um, uh, it is uh, differently manifest uh, they did. So we have these two different distinct, uh, distinctive groups, career professionals and first earners. Uh, career for professionals likely to be high educated say that I want to get promoted and I feel like I'm going to fall behind among my colleagues if I have a baby. She's, uh, so she's afraid of her career interruption. Uh, whereas forced honors likely to be uh, low educated, she was different thing. I'm afraid I have to keep working to raise a baby because uh, my body is a must uh, these days. Uh, dual earning is a must these days. But doing both uh, is so hard for a woman. It's hard, it's hard physically. So uh, I read, um, so we can read that in the context of a long work hour culture and strong ideal work norm prevalent in almost all workplaces in Korea, Professional women afraid of career in disruption while childbearing, while unskilled women afraid of being forced to work and second shift for childbearing. So here's a summary. We saw in Korea, there appears a dominant narrative of fertility. If you can't take responsibility, you'd better not to give birth. Uh, this narrative setting the fertility bar much higher than the marriage bar is mostly cl most clearly articulated among middle class men and women, but is widespread across all socioeconomic groups. So instead of diverging values, uh, we see widespread adoption of mainstream values. So how can we interpret this? I think we should consider, we should pay more attention to the role of diffusion of new ideas in the change of fertility and in diffusion, it is the middle class that uh, leads to social contagion. As inequality increases, it increases middle class anxiety to fear downward mobility. To avoid the risk of downward mobility, middle class invest more in their children's education. They set the fertility bar even higher. Um, and through gossips, conversational interactions, and popular media, the middle class narrative of fertility dominates the discursive representation. If, um, I think it is a similar to Ishijuka's recent finding uh, of the convergence to middle-class parenting norms in, in the U.S. as well. So I, I argue that widespread adoption of middle-class narrative of fertility is a novel driver, weakening, uh, driver of weakening differential fertility in the context of uh, rising inequality. So what is the policy implication? Uh, I think we can uh, ask this question. It's a little bit negative, um, uh, sad uh, prediction, but it is likely that the gender egalitarianist prediction on the utility, uh, fertility U-curve may not be realized in the context of rising inequality and polarization of a women's labor market in Korea. Um, in the presence of high fertility bar, maintaining dual earning becomes ever more important to secure economic stability of family, a necessary condition for childbearing decision. However, the Korean corporate work environment still incompatible with workers with family responsibilities, uh, mainly uh, women, 
affect negatively women's childbearing intention, both middle-class uh, career-oriented professionals and working-class birth earners. So I would say um, uh, changing Korean workplace culture, uh, so it's not to restrict the woman's choice between work and baby, can have a positive impact on women's fertility decision in all socioeconomic positions. Um, and uh, the, the U.S. has the prevention of family responsibility discrimination. Uh, and I think it's a good uh, example and it can be a good beginning to uh, solve this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, our second presenter in this session is Jennifer Silva. Jennifer's an assistant professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. And as you can see on the screen, her title is Navigating an Uncertain Future, How American Young Adults Narrate Their Experiences of Economic Insecurity and Social Upheaval in the 21st Century. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this event. It's been really exciting to learn from all of you. I wanted to start today by just talking a little bit about studying the middle class and especially studying subjective experiences. Policy research on the American and Korean middle class are, is often dominated by quantitative methodologies, large scale surveys, administrative data, which are crucial. But qualitative data like in-depth interviews, as we just saw, can also help us understand the everyday experiences of middle class people, how they confront economic insecurity, rising inequality, political upheaval, and gender and family change. And so the work that I will be presenting starts with the systems of meanings that people identify through in-depth interviews. And this is sort of, you know, the goal is to listen to how real people experience these large trends and think about how to involve them in the construction of policy aimed to serve them. So this is somewhat sometimes helpful just thinking about, we've talked a lot about what is happening and now we're trying to understand a little bit more of how and why we might be seeing uh, the large trends that uh, we've seen in both countries. Um, so, uh, we talked a little bit about what it is to be middle class, and I wanted to add that the American middle class, it's, you know, not just an income bracket, but I think also signifies a, a way of life, maybe a sense of belonging and inclusion, um, often seen as the backbone of America, is vital to the health and vibrancy of our economy and our democracy and society. And this way of life seems to be under threat or unpredictable because many of what we see as the stable endings of adulthood, like owning a home, completing higher education, finding a good job, getting married and having children have become delayed, unattainable or undesirable or risky, um, you know, over the last several decades. And so by interviewing people, especially young people, it helps us understand kind of new meanings of what it is to be middle class in America today and how people are creating uh, these kinds of new stories of the self. Um, and so when I talk about interviews, they're kind of situated within this broader story of deregulation of labor, of loss of protections from the market, shrinking safety nets that kind of leave people feeling alone and isolated. Also, uh, within a larger context of a loss of trust in a wide range of public institutions and political processes. Um, a, sister of higher, a system of higher education where people feel like they must go to college, but one that's also complex, competitive, and risky. Um, and also, as we just heard about, destabilizing of marriage, you know, persistent burden of second shift on women, time squeeze, and also a uh, rise of non-marital childbearing. So within this larger context, my work asks how American young people confront this world of insecure work, stagnant incomes, work and family time squeeze, and increasing risk. Um, I'm also interested in these sort of deeper questions about how people forge what feels like a meaningful life, how they deal with fear and disappointment, how they think about their futures, and also how race and gender identity shape people's opportunities and their constraints, as well as how they think about politics and the self and um, where they belong. And um, I'll be drawing on 
Um, many studies of middle class and working class Americans um, that I've conducted from about 2014 onward, um, collaborations with uh, Robert D. Putnam, uh, with the Brookings Institution, and also the Roosevelt Project at MIT. And uh, so altogether, I've, I think I've conducted about 600 interviews. Um, and then what I'll be saying today is also informed by prominent work from social scientists and sociology of work and gender, economic inequality and um, political life. And so I want to start by um, talking about a first uh, overview, which is these are some of the major themes of what it feels like to be middle class um, that I hear, which is kind of a sense of impending loss and uncertainty. Um, feelings of distrust and resentment, unworkability of any kinds of traditional family and gender arrangements, um, sense of persistent inequality, and also the sense that the system uh, is rigged against them, which is also sort of balanced with this middle class attempt to still make their lives better. Um, so I'll tell you if, about a few people I've interviewed. So one is Marion, who has worked as a plastic manufacturer for over 10 years um, in the Midwest in the United States. Um, and she, she's been worked at many car plants. And she says, you know, I was reading an article recently about the decrease in manpower needed to produce electric vehicles. And I think it's gonna be a 60% reduction. The workforce will reduce. And she says, okay, well, I'm trying to move into the health industry because the most recent plant where I worked had laid her off. She says, I don't think they want to deal with us anymore. They didn't want to deal with the union anymore. They wanted to bust us. And that's how I feel. Um, and she, she talks about this persistent sense of distrust and cynicism in her life um, because she's suffered so much emotionally and financially working in the auto industry. She says, my life turned upside down when General Motors shuttered their doors. She says, personally, the feeling of dislocation was so scary. I'm not a young lady anymore. I'm a single mom. My marriage suffered and being left behind. There's lots of people that transferred out and it makes me angry. And as far as job opportunities, I didn't have a job opportunity at the new factory. It was either take less than the wage job to support my family and barely make it or take the opportunity to learn more. Um, but she says, even you know, starting again, I'm still making less than I was making before and I don't have healthcare coverage. Um, and, you know, when I was talking to these workers who were displaced from traditional auto manufacturing, um, another worker told me he was just waiting for his job to be outsourced. He said somewhere in Asia, he thinks that um, the job is going to be outsourced somewhere closer access to lithium needed for electric car batteries. He says maybe they'll even even pull lithium from African mines pulled by children. Um, but he says, I see them closing down plants. And many of the people I talked to started to get the sort of uh, conspiracy theory tone where they kept talking about they and how their jobs are going to be taken away. Um, another example would be from Joe, who is an electronics manufacturer in um, Pennsylvania. And he would leave for work every day at um, six in the morning and he builds things and it's an entry level job, you know, making things with his hands. It doesn't pay very well. Um, but he only has a high school diploma. Um, and he says, you know, there's always the risk of outsourcing. You know, six months ago, the part I was making got outsourced to Mexico and I just got moved to something else. And he says, um, you know, they have this time squeeze. And he says, but when his, you know, wife who works the night shift as a nurse comes home, you know, she reminds me I can't provide enough for her to stay home and not work. Um, and, you know, he feels himself just worrying, for example, if the roof blew off in a storm, the insurance wouldn't cover it, they'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and interestingly, when he talks about his politics, um, even though he is very leftist in terms of economic views, says he's kind of a socialist, he's very against immigration, and um, is starting to um, become very interested in white nationalist politics um, as a kind of reaction against this um, sense of insecurity and uncertainty. Um, so here's another example, which is Diana, who is a Hispanic woman living in Nevada. Um, and she, I interviewed online. She was actually, she was divorced. She had four kids. She had just gotten engaged again. Um, she was trying to work as a virtual assistant remotely by day and then trying to take classes at night. Um, and so 
she basically says, you know, she got divorced. She has to be able to survive on her own. She doesn't want to ever have to depend on a man again to pay her bills. Um, but at the same time, um, she's been tired of working where she feels discriminated against. Um, she says, I can't not work a flexible schedule. She says, I have to have flexibility. Um, when her son was born, you know, she took four weeks off of work unpaid for maternity leave. And then she said her boss gave her job to someone else. Um, and so she said she was so mad, she was so jaded. And that's why she decided she wanted to work only for herself. Um, so she got a virtual assistant job online. Um, and she said she's actually very enthusiastic about it because she's taking care of her baby. She has no childcare, she's, but she's still able to breastfeed and have her baby eating and napping. And then while he naps, she's able to work on her virtual job. Um, and she says, she tells everybody like, go get a laptop at the pawn shop. You know, she says, if your husband gets laid off, there can be work for you because you can work around your kid's nap time. And she says, if your partner gets laid off, he can watch the kids for you so you can, you know, still make money. Um, and one of the interesting parts about Diana is that um, she says, I feel very bad because she knows it's a really bad time in the economy. But she goes, well, you know, maybe if the housing market crashes, though, maybe I'll be able to buy a house one day. Um, and she's like, you know, maybe I won't be just sitting here like I am now, like, is my rent going to go up in a year and I won't be able to pay it. So she's like trying to be optimistic about, you know, every part of her life. Um, to take it from another point of view, there would be Elijah. He's a 31 year old man who lived in Washington, DC, and he was an attorney. Um, and he worked at a very prestigious corporate law firm. And he said, you know, you have to have a 80 hours, and he says, but you know, 75 of them are billable hours. And so there's always this pressure to be at work more and more hours um, every day. Um, and he said, so he and his wife is also a lawyer and they got pregnant right away after they were married. Um, and they both worked right up until the birth. And then she took off four months, partly paid and partly unpaid. But Elijah felt like he couldn't take any time off. He says he took almost two weeks, but he said, I couldn't feel like I could take more, the pressure of demands from clients. He's like, yeah, no one's ever gonna be gone for a whole month. Um, and he says like, yeah, the last firm I was at, they told us we had unlimited vacation, which means we have no vacation um, because yeah, you finish all your work and you can go, but then they're gonna fire me and say, I'm not working enough. Um, and he and his wife actually eventually got divorced. Um, they were, you know, they put their daughter in daycare. That was like paying another month's rent for $2,000 a month. Um, and he said, it was just a huge adjustment. You know, this person, he said, your sleep schedule, your not sleep schedule, making sure the baby had everything she needed and then working and trying to be present and involved. And he said, you only have so much bandwidth if you're already burnt out. Both people burnt out from work, very stressful long hours. Many people, home is too stressful. And then you're kind of stressing each other out and hurting each other. Um, and so now he is taking care of his daughter every other weekend, he pays child support. And he told me he's actually excited he's gonna leave his law firm, start his own business, even though he knows it's also very risky um, because he feels like he needs to have control over his time, just the way that Diana did with her laptop from the pawn shop. Um, and so I'll just provide one more example. And this is uh, Katie, who's a 25 year old white woman um, who lives in rural Kansas. And um, she was about $30,000 in debt when I interviewed her. She had just graduated from a nearby regional college. Um, and she told me, you know, right now my loans are on hold because I don't make enough income, so I can't pay them back. Um, but she's really worried that she'll get into more debt and have to declare bankruptcy, but she'll never, you know, she said, I'll always have that debt. And she says she wants to get more education, but she's not sure if she should take this next step because um, it will be so expensive. Um, and she talks a lot about how she paid so much for the social science degree, but she isn't really sure what to do with it. Um, she said, you know, I have a social science degree, but everyone thinks that means I should be a social worker, but I don't have a social work license. Um, so she tried to, you know, volunteer at a non-profit, uh, but she couldn't live on this low salary. And she's like, so basically, why do I have this degree? What am I doing? Why am I doing something so low paying? And she said, I put everything on hold. Um, and she says, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do next. I don't know where I want to go from here. I've always had like kind of a dream of what I wanted to do, but I have no idea what to do now that this didn't work out. 
Um, and she was interesting because when we talk about having children or getting married, she's like, I definitely do want to get married, but I'm kind of in a situation where I'm not sure what's going to happen with my job, whether I'm going to move out of state. I'm afraid of getting attached to someone and then wanting to, you know, move. And then she says, can I really take care of a kid and add to my debt that I already have? And she says she's actually considered adopting a child who's already like older to avoid having to pay for like the year zero to 12. So she says, if I adopt a kid who's 12 or so, that means I have to take care of them for six years. And then after that, I could still take care of them to the extent because I'm adopting them, but I wouldn't have as much financial responsibility as I would if I started with a newborn. Um, so I've also thought about that as well. Um, and so Katie is, you know, she's, you know, she's very thoughtful and informed. She tells me about how, you know, COVID-19 has made inequality worse, about how there's the people you know, who can't afford laptops and the people who are so protected about it because they can work from home and keep their benefits. Um, and she is tough to me politically. And she's like, we're under a system that benefits people who are more wealthy or benefits corporations and that sort of thing. Um, so I'd rather change the entire system than elect someone who's just gonna work in the existing system that still isn't very effective. So I'm not really excited about any candidate ever, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic one. Five minutes. And so, thank you. And so that's kind of um, Katie. So just to sort of uh, bring this back and think a little bit about, um, you know, policy implications from these uh, vignettes. Um, one other thing to talk about is how, you know, people's way of thinking about the world, even when we hear what they say and don't think it makes sense, um, can provide very crucial insights into the demographic patterns that we observe, um, sometimes in ways like, I wouldn't have imagined someone would think about adopting a 12 year old because she was too afraid of having a baby for the first 12 years and the cost. Um, and, you know, just think about how well intentioned policies could fail to reach people if we, you know, make assumptions about what mo motivates their behavior, but don't always understand what's really driving it. Um, and so I think the work that I've talked to today, um, you know, does draw attention to stagnant incomes, uh, precarity of jobs and benefits. Uh, reliance on debt, and also like the huge time squeeze facing Americans. Um, and some of the policy solutions that may, might come out of these would be, you know, job training, more support for education, paid family leave, and affordable childcare. Um, but I also think that, you know, talking to people, there's also a need to think about how to bring people back into communities and also think about how to rebuild trust. Because many of the people I talked to felt like they were kind of isolated, didn't trust anyone, didn't believe that their voice mattered in terms of policy or political action and were kind of um, disabling themselves politically rather than being like the backbone of, of democracy in the middle class. Um, but I would say that most of the people I talked to are optimistic um, and kind of ready for big structural changes that support everyday people over corporate interests and politicians. Okay, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, uh, our third presentation uh, in this session is by Bungu K. Uh, and the title here is Perception of Social Mobility in South Korea. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, let me start. So, so thank you for having me here. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the perception of social mobility in South Korea. So even though I'm dealing with uh, some perception, uh, uh, this is uh, different from the earlier presentation or uh, using the qualitative studies. In this study, I'm using some survey data. In this study, I measure the perception of the intergenerational income mobility by using a randomized Binet design study. I compare these perceptions across the different social groups and compare the perceived and the real chance of intergenerational income mobility. I also compare the Korean case with the American case. Okay, so empirical evidence shows that there is a discrepancy between the reality and the perception of the chance of social mobility. 
Uh, while we have seen that intergenerational mobility remains stable or even increasing over time in South Korea, the Koreans are not very optimistic about their chance of the being upwardly mobile. And the discrepancy itself is an interesting phenomenon, but in this study, I rather focus on the measurement issues. Usually the studies of the perception of social mobility use the instrument based on the respondent subjective evaluation of the chance of social mobility, something like uh, the from low to high. But the meaning of low or high should depend on the individual's uh, different uh, criteria. So it can, it is it's difficult to uh, compare uh, different persons uh, uh, judgment about the chance of social mobility. So in these studies, we, I apply uh, a measure developed by the Shiwei Chen and her students uh, published in 2019 to measure the perception of the social mobility. Uh, this study, so the titled Americans Overestimate the Intergenerational Persistence uh, in Income Ranks. The primary finding of this study is shown in this graph. Uh, it, it shows the, that the rank rank relationship in the perception and the reality in the United States. While the purple dashes to uh, diagonal lines represent the perfect association between parents and uh, offspring's income rank, that means that the children's income rank is exactly the same as the uh, parent income rank. The horizontal line is the opposite scenarios, so like uh, the no association between them. The red line uh, represents real rank rank slope uh, from the cherries and other uh, economic studies, which is uh, 0.34 and the brown line shows that the perceived rank rank slope collected from the uh, Shiwe Chance and Wen studies, which is uh, 0.65 uh, and much steeper than the real slope. This difference shows that the Americans kind of overestimate the intergenerational positions in the income rank. And in addition to this uh, discrepancy, they show that the, the perceived uh, uh, rank rank slope is differ by different social group or uh, like uh, education, household income, and the political ideologies. And slow for the better educated and higher income and the liberals are steeper than uh, their uh, counterpart. So in this study, I try to uh, replicate the, these previous studies on uh, American case the, in the in Korean context to measure the perceived or perceived perception of the social mobility. I use 2018 uh, KMOS data, which is an online survey. I'm going to talk about how uh, the KMOS measure the uh, perception of social mobility in the next slide. And the, inform, uh, the problem in kind of limitation of this study is that uh, I cannot get some kind of very reliable estimate for the rank rank slope like in the uh, United States. So in this study, I use estimates from a previous study that I participated using the population level administrative data is called uh, National Health Insurance Service data uh, from 2002 and 2016 and uh, make a comparison and also uh, and compare uh, the real slopes and the perceived slope and I also try to make a comparison across uh, subgroups of perception. I also applied a logolinear models with the uh, ha that has the main diagonal parameters to see how people evaluate the chance of uh, intergenerational income mobility. Okay. okay, so here is the measurement. The slide shows how I measure the perception of social mobility, which is borrowed, uh, borrowed from the Chen and Wen's the previous studies. Uh, parental income rank is given to the respondents randomly. Uh, respondents are asked to uh, assign some value for the children's expected income ranks or uh, given their uh, parental income. This question is asked three times for each individual to increase the, the data point. Hence, we have about uh, 3,000 data points to assess the perceived rank rank slope. 
uh, in the next uh, several slides, I'm showing that the assignment of income rank is a uh, parental income rank is really random by the survey design because we are using uh, online survey. So we can manipulate the uh, parental income randomly. So this shows, this graph shows the distribution of parental income for each trial. Parental income is uh, uh, income evenly distributed on uh, each time. So each time, so kind of showing that uh, this uh, variable is randomly assigned. And there is another evidence that the random assignment, the distribution of parental income in the second trial, given the first trial, so we can see that there is no association between the uh, in parental income in the first trial and the second trial. So confirming that uh, our uh, design is okay. And finally, we can see that the we can see that. Or, or result from the regression of parental income on the respondents' characteristics. So you can see the the p value uh, is uh, greater than the 0 0.05 and uh, mostly uh, greater than 0 0.5. That means that uh, the parental income assignment is not associated any uh, individual's characteristics, confirming the random assignment of parental income. Here is the kind of the main kind of finding, main result, the simple one. So that shows that the association between the uh, parental income and the children's income. We can clearly see that there is a positive association between the parental income rank and the children's income rank. Uh, in particular, the Koreans think that the chance of intergenerational immobility of income rank is very high at the bottom and at the top of the income distribution. You can see that here, 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 this is the bottom of the distribution and uh, this number shows the uh, parental income rank. So most of the, the, the lowest uh, income rank is recruited from the, the parents or parents of the very poor pa uh, parents. But so we can see that uh, other sectors do not uh, inflow uh, or flow into that poor part. And the uh, same thing happened to the, the, the highest level of the income. So people think that uh, the highest income uh, children uh, will be uh, recruited from the highest income of parents. So people think that the bottom and the top 10% of the in the uh, children's income distribution uh, is will be self-recruited and showing that the strong stickiness in the extremes are expected. Okay, this is the, the main finding. So that's a slope, the rank rank slope from uh, all the uh, perceived rank rank slope. Uh, perceived rank slope is uh, 0.41 which is much lower than the American one, uh, which is 0.65, meaning that the Koreans evaluate the chance of intergenerational income mobility more positively than the Americans, or they think that the persistence of the income across generation is much weaker in Korea than Korea than the America. Uh, although the perceived rank in the Korea is much flatter than the American slope, this is still much steeper than the real Korean rank rank slope. The graph in the next uh, right shows that uh, the previous studies are showing that real uh, income rank uh, association between parental income rank and uh, children's income rank. Uh, that slope is surprisingly low, so 0 0.0124. So I'm not going to talk about the weakness of this study. I actually participated in this study. So there is some data limitation. And so uh, particularly, let me see here. So we kind of measure the, the income, parental income in age 15 to 21 uh, and their own income in uh, age 29 to 32. It's, the interval is very short. There is one of the limitation and there are some missing and so there are lots of limitations. So that, that's, so I'm not uh, trying to argue that that is uh, legally represent. 
the real association between parental income rank and the children's income rank. But uh, those, this number, it, we, even though we cannot take this value as a face value, but uh, we can say that the perceived uh, the association between parental income rank and the children's income rank is much steeper than the real uh, uh, real income uh, association between uh, parental income and the children's income. This graph shows that the uh, immobility uh, parameters are uh, in, measured in the large ratios. As we can see from this graph, this graph, we can clearly see that the highest the large ratio at the two extremes, like a here top of the distribution and the bottom of the distribution is much higher as uh, ratio. That means that people think that the, there is very strong intergenerational income immobility in the, at the top and at the bottom of the uh, distribution. And the similar pattern found in the real, real data, the same data source, or uh, it's the top and the top uh, or has the same or uh, very high uh, ratios. But there are two different patterns we can observe. In real data, we can see, we cannot see strong immobility, immobility at the bottom. So here, so we don't see any uh, special or uh, really strong association between them at the bottom. And uh, and another thing is that uh, this uh, RG ratio is even though very high, there is much uh, very uh, small compared with the perceived one. Perceived one is uh, close to 15, but the uh, real one is about uh, three or something. So that means that still people also perceive the notion of the income immobility is much stronger than the, the parents observed in the real data. Okay, so next move the slope difference is across the perceived or uh, perceived uh, you know, association. We can see that the uh, age matters and the uh, gender doesn't matter and uh, marital status and education and uh, occupation and uh, subjective uh, class matters for uh, matter for the perceived uh, association. Uh, and this is the graph for the, by age. We can see that older people uh, has a flatter, a flatter, or uh, think the association between parental income and uh, uh, children's income rank is uh, weaker than the younger people. And uh, here, never married or uh, slope is uh, a little bit uh, steeper. And uh, Professional and managerial job holders or uh, uh, slope is uh, kind of steeper than the non-professional or uh, managerial job holders. Okay, let me wrap up my findings. First, the perceived rank rank slope in Korea uh, is much flatter than the American slope, but still this is much steeper than the Korean reality. Second, we can see strong stickiness at the extremes, at the bottom and at the top. And finally, rank rank slope differs by age and SES. And there are some issues not uh, fully discussed in this presentation, such as how we can interpret the rank rank slope and uh, the subgroup differences in the rank rank slope. And so I don't have enough time to dis fully discuss about that. So any suggestion and comments should be appreciated. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. This is such a rare uh, thing that we actually have a little more time than planned uh, at the end of presentations. And by the way, I, I apologize. I forgot to say at the beginning that uh, Bungu is an associate professor of sociology at Kukmun uh, University. Uh, so we've got three interesting presentations uh, on perceptions and views and how people are thinking about trying to understand uh, income inequality and other elements of the present situation in the US and, uh, and South Korea. Um, let me just check the chat real quick. Okay, there's one question. I, let's go ahead and do that and then we can open the floor unless others appear in the chat. This is for Jennifer 
says, thank you for sharing your interview data. Really interesting. Could you share any United States policies or systems that can alleviate the economic instability of the American young adults that were discussed in your interviews? Sure. Um, I'm trying to think about what was discussed. Uh, so for me, I would, I would focus on policies that would um, I think as we talked about yesterday, possibly uh, decouple uh, people's earnings from their ability to have access to benefits. Um, and I would include things like um, paid, you know, maternity leave or paid parental leave in there, as well as um, more affordable childcare, because um, many of the families were trying to basically have be full-time caretakers and full-time workers all at once. Um, and um, I think, uh, there was a lot of support in my interviews for um, government um, intervening in terms of more opportunities. So like more affordable education or job training, for sure. Um, there was support for that as well. Okay, another, another question, and thank you, Jennifer. Another question in the chat. Um, the Korea, this is to Professor Kim, the Korean governments, both federal and local, have been making all kinds of efforts to combat the dismal fertility rate for quite some time to no avail. What do you think is the problem? Do you think an approach from the class uh, divergence will make a difference in framing and devising policies for a higher birth rate? So thank you for the question. And uh... Yeah, it's been uh, well debated, um, the, the effectiveness of the uh, policy intervention uh, in terms of the, you know, the, uh, the boosting up the uh, fertility rate. I mean, it has a, a very long history of that. And the conclusion is that it has been very useless, right? So I think the, uh, gen I think the reason why we, the, the governmental intervention was not successful, the pro-natalist intervention was not successful, uh, was because uh, we left the most important part untouched. That's the corporate world. So all these interventions was about, you know, providing subsidies or providing childcare and things like that. But uh, we didn't touch the, co you know, what is happening uh, in corporate world. So, uh, so in corporate world, uh, group, the ideal worker norm uh, based. Um, you know, prejudice, stereotypes, discrimination against caregivers, women, it's all uh, there happening. And the long work hour culture, it hasn't changed a bit, but we it didn't touch that part. So I think that's the main reason why we were so um, unsuccessful in, uh, you know, uh, not just boosting, uh, you know, fertility rate, but making people feel that they can have babies, they can give birth to new life in this world. So I think it's time to uh, uh, change, not, not change people's mind, but to change the, the way we work in corporate world in Korea. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question now for Professor K. How do you verify respondent self-reported income rank? A methodological question here. Yes, yes. So I was uh, too quick about the, in this slide. So the, I'm not asking that the individual's income rank. So the, uh, their the judgment about the chance of mobility. So question is like that. Suppose you rank family income in the in Korea is the American version from the poorest to the uh, richest. Consider a person whose parents' income rank higher than something like thirty percent uh, of the uh, Korean family, as shown in this. So people are asked to evaluate some hypothetical situation from particular income distribution, like a parental income is like 30% or 40% or something, and the expected uh, income of their children, not their uh, the, the hypothetical person's children, not their own children. So that's so because of using, we are using this instrument, uh, this question maybe the, so, the, not, we are not uh, interested in the in the, uh, respondent income rank, real income rank, or something like that. Okay. Uh, okay. There's a question from Kwang Yong to everyone, uh, I guess, in the chat. 
The question is, how can policies suggested by researchers to improve the disturbing middle-class life be adopted by policymakers? Think tanks also suggest many policies to policymakers. Academic researchers seem to be far from those policymakers in both countries. What will be effective strategies for academic researchers to enhance the possibility of adopting policy suggestions? That's to anyone who wants to chime in. I uh, would like to explain a little bit the background of my uh, <laughs> questions. And uh, nowadays, uh, there are many uh, critics of the current uh, social uh, problems and also some kind of a suggestion uh, for alternative uh, policy uh, ideas. Uh, but usually, uh, those ideas are shared by uh, researchers only, policymakers and politicians and some uh, bureaucrats uh, didn't pay attention to uh, those uh, policy suggestions. So uh, there should, should be uh, some uh, uh, other uh, alternatives uh, to uh, make those uh, policy ideas uh, effective in a real uh, world. So it might be uh, a part of uh, some uh, social movement or uh, some kind of uh, uh, new uh, engagement in policy making. But uh, usually uh, academic researchers uh, don't have enough uh, network and information and some kind of uh, time uh, in, in making that kind of uh, a new uh, attempt. So uh, I'm uh, considering uh, that kind of uh, issue uh, right now. So I'd like to get some uh, uh, opinion uh, from uh, uh, you. Thank you. Please go ahead, Jung. Uh, I think it's an interesting, you know, question to think about. Um, and but but you know, as the old said, the saying goes, I mean, you can you can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink, right? <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> so uh, then, it's, so our question is like, uh, you know, how to how to make the horse drink water? or something like that. But uh, I think for that, uh, of course, I mean, we need a lot of institutional, uh, you know, things to, to, to make, to, to, to funnel our ideas to, you know, policymakers, and, you know, networks, institutions, all that. I mean, you know, forum like this, it's all great. But I think, uh, I think it depends on the way we deliver our, our idea. Uh, I think the, um, the, you know, so basically my idea is less critique, more solution. So without uh, providing uh, the actual workable solutions uh, of the problem, just by criticizing problem doesn't help uh, to make the horse drink the water. So uh, I think the, um, uh, the, the make them uh, think uh, that uh, make people think that better world is possible. Uh, we can, if we can change this and this, and you know, we can live a better life. You know, uh, uh, encouraging this kind of th that kind of uh, idea, uh, affection, uh, is I think really important. Okay, maybe I'll jump in with uh, my quick two cents. Uh, I think in the American context, there are lots of competing forces in the in the policy idea space, and, and that's been true for a long time. So there are corporations, there are labor unions, there are a variety of other interest groups. There are lots and lots of think tanks, especially in Washington, D.C., but also increasingly at the state level and, and trying to influence the federal government even outside of Washington, D.C. Um, 
And then there are all kinds of individuals uh, and, and other interests, many of which have, uh, have money. And then there are academics. And I do think academics have had success at, at various moments in time. Sometimes that's with individual policy suggestions. Sometimes that's with putting forward a kind of general policy orientation. I'm thinking here of Milton Friedman, uh, who came along right at the right moment in, in history uh, and won his Nobel Prize and was very influential for a particular, uh, ac answering a particular academic economic policy question, but then also had a lot of, a lot of views and a, a way to, uh, to spread his message. Uh, this has been true in the conservative legal scholars movement also in the United States, uh, but I think you now see it on the, on the other side as, as well. Um, and, and I will say that I think economists to some degree in, in the United States have always had uh, uh, greater access to, to policymakers in terms of at least getting a listen for their, their policy suggestions. But I also think that that's changing. I see more sociologists um, uh, at least being able to, to offer their voice. You know, as to who wins out, uh, I, I, I think that's a complicated question. A uh, simple answer is that money always wins out, but I, I've grown increasingly skeptical of that kind of simplistic answer. Even though in the United States, uh, of all places, one would think that it, <laughs> it's probably most likely to be true, and at various points, I, I, I think it has been. But so anyway, I, I, I think it's complicated. The, the best you can do is, uh, is try, um, and sometimes that means a kind of overarching policy orientation. Sometimes it might mean a very narrow, specific policy suggestion. Uh, but, but maybe I'm... I think I've grown less pessimistic uh, as, as I get older, or maybe because I see the American landscape changing a little bit for better or worse. Okay, um, does anyone have anything else to say on this particular question? Okay, so there's a question or comment here in the chat. I think there's a problem with mainstream politics. I doubt there are ideal solutions, first of all, but even if we have it, the current political party system is not effective in addressing social concerns. The two-party system, both in the US and Korea, are not effective uh, dealing with popular demands and delivering proper policies. Okay, that's really more of a comment, although if someone wants to respond, uh, they could. There's another question for Professor Kay. Do you wanna to try to answer this? Another methodological question, maybe this is a follow-up to the first. Could possibly also leave that for a, a separate conversation. Uh, I see a, there's a, another question in the chat. What impacts do the efforts for labor flexibility caused by the sharing economy in the US and Korea have on the middle class? maybe those i i'm not able to answer the second question so the first question is to me maybe somewhat technical or some data issues so i mentioned that the the estimates is not very reliable and kind of probably underestimates the the the, the association between parental income and the children's income the one thing is that the, the age gap between the origin and the destination and in this study the income source is pretty reliable i think because it's uh, admin data so that's uh, based on the, the national health insurance data they collect the uh, people's income based on uh, to assign the the insurance insurance uh, insurance so so income source is reliable but uh, there are some this uh the differences in the reliability of the data depending on their work status. The employees or so, uh, the labor income is uh, uh, captured very uh, correctly, but other sources of the income like uh, the, uh, what can I, how can I say this? So not labor income, but what is this? Is how income is So, the business income, some, some, something like so the income from some business work or some, some other source other than the labor income is not exactly captured. So, so there is uh, the issues of data issue, but 
Uh, when we try to restrict our sample to both uh, parents and uh, the children's uh, uh, the main uh, source is uh, labor income, so we have the similar results. So uh, regardless of the income sources, uh, the we, can, we get the kind of some consistent estimates like uh, the rank rank slope between 0 0.1 point 0.15 or something like that. So uh, that was uh, what we found, but so uh, we still concerned that so the so kind of under uh, capturing the individual's income, maybe there's some 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 mis mistake or some loopholes in the, the assessing the, the insurance insurance rate. So that's kind of limitation. Can I just, before we get to the sharing and gig economy, can I throw in a quick question here? So why why do you or anybody else think that that this is the case that Americans and uh, Koreans both uh, um, overestimate the degree of inequality of opportunity? That is to say, they think things are worse than, than they are. I know in the United States, if you ask people about the level of income or wealth inequality, they make the opposite mistake. That is to say, they think there's less inequality than there actually is. In fact, far less. I, I don't know if that's also true in Korea. But then now we have this opposite finding when it comes to, if we're, let's just consider this a, a measure of equality of opportunity. It, it's not a perfect one, but it's it's not so bad. So they, they overestimate inequality of, of opportunity. Why? What, what, what is causing this? I mean, can I quickly say something? Okay, so I think it is uh, related with uh, what I found in, um, from my research, I can give you that it's a uh, middle class perception that dominates the discourses. So I, I found that um, uh, K, Professor Gass' uh, research, it was the uh, professionals that tends to uh, have uh, exaggerated perception of the uh, the uh, intergenerational mobility. I mean, what much more pessimistic, much more negative ideas. It's an basically anxiety. So I think the, uh, and, and the, this current, under this current uh, uh, media environment, the middle class uh, voices, the voices of middle class is widespread and widely adopted. So I think it's one of, it can be one of the reasons. I, I kind of agree with the Professor Kim's uh, interpretation. So we can see that the younger people have uh, over and more overly estimated, overestimates the intergenerational persistence of income. So that should be related with their anxiety about the future. And so anxiety leads to the overestimates the kind of intergenerational persistency or something like that. So that's, we can say that. Yes, I agree huh? the long-term uh, expectation for uh, um, the mobility is quite kind of, you know, uh, kind of decreased these days for the younger people. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the Korean society, for example, uh, is actually kind of moving toward the consum uh, you know, uh, consumer society very rapidly, right? And they actually kind of, um, you know, calculate um, their power uh, for consumption. And there are a lot of kind of, you know, uh, social media actually exaggerating their consumption power uh, by upper middle class. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, think that are not really kind of, you know, reaching that actually uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, point. And a lot of discouragement is actually taking place uh, for the younger people. And that's another kind of, you know, uh, reason uh, that you know, they actually feel that uh, there is a lot of uh, inequality. And at the same time, education, you know, a lot of people, especially younger people or, you know, their parents, right, um, you know, the uh, input uh, for the private education is, getting, you know, uh, important uh, for kind of entering the kind of, you know, privi uh, privileged, um, you know, university. And that actually kind of um, unexperienced uh, uh, that uh, probably uh, the chances, life chances will be really kind of, you know, getting different because of the educational 
um, opportunity kind of based on the you know increasing private education um, you know among um, middle and high school students. My understanding of the uh, uh, issue uh, is based on some kind of a, a composition effect. And in nine, early 1980s, the proportion of uh, university graduates uh, among the same age cohort was less than 15%. So almost all uh, university graduates uh, could get good jobs. Nowadays, almost 70% of the young court are uh, university graduates. So most of them uh, cannot find good jobs, so-called uh, jobs in a conglomerate and big uh, companies uh, guaranteed uh, by good high uh, salary. So uh, many, uh, highly educated uh, young uh, people uh, just uh, uh, complain. They couldn't find good job compared to their parents. Their parents, uh, has uh, many of them ha has, has uh, uh, high school uh, degree, not a university degree. Nevertheless, uh, the young people uh, cannot find good jobs. So that kind of uh, uh, some uh, discrepancy uh, is, is a serious uh, issue. And another one uh, is that, so nowadays uh, uh, the middle class expanded a lot uh, from 1980 to uh, 2020. So uh, majority of uh, kids, are from uh, middle class parents, but they cannot uh, move uh, up. They don't have a possibility of uh, upward mobility because uh, uh, upward mobility requires uh, different uh, asset. So, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's need uh, uh, some money capital. They, they can only maintain their uh, middle class status by education, but usually education uh, costs too much. And uh, uh, many of uh, middle class kids fail to get good, get into uh, uh, good universities. So they uh, had have uh, uh, some difficulty in uh, reproducing their middle class status. So that kind of uh, uh, some uh, competition uh, effect uh, might be a, a very a serious one. In uh, and so that's my explanation. Can I do one more thing? If for this Please issue, so you know, as I showed you in the presentation, so the uh, real uh, immobility parameter is the highest in the at the top of the distribution, and people the kind of we are exposed to the media and so other sources that the kind of behaviors of the top income people, the high, the very richest people. So in that distribution, in that part of, part of the population, there is a very strong intergenerational association. So it uh, exists and we kind of exposed to that story very often. So people's perception may be uh, dominated by these kind of the top income people. So that's why we kind of overestimate the overall pattern of the intergenerational uh, association. Then maybe uh, another kind of explanation to uh, explain the discrepancy between the perception and uh, the reality. Okay, well, there's lots and lots more that we could potentially explore here, but we're out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> So let me say thank you to the today's presenters and all the presenters. I've really enjoyed this, found it very stimulating. I wish we had a lot more time to continue this discussion. Uh, no. I'll just turn it back to who. All right. Thank you all presenters for your wonderful insights. 
This concludes the 2022 Korea-U.S. Policy Dialogue on Economic Inequality and the Future of the Middle Class. On behalf of KDI School, I would like to thank you all for your time and commitment, despite the time difference over the last two days. We hope this dialogue has renewed everyone's interest in the topic and further hope that this will help promote an exchange of policy ideas and knowledge between the two countries, as well as between academia and the public sector, as Professor Shin has mentioned. We'll meet you again with another interesting topic next year. Thank you so very much.